half a century of independence, 11 elections, three presidents. And now, Kenya heads to the polls in the country's biggest election ever. From the shores of the Indian Ocean to the peaks of Mount Kenya, the valleys of the Great Rift to the rainforest of the West, the vast arid plains of northern Kenya to the grasslands of the south. Right across the country, over 14 million voters will decide. Tonight, Martha Karua, Peter Kenneth, Uhuru Kenyatta, James Olekiyapi, Musalia Mudavadi, and Raila Odinga interview for the country's top job in Kenya's first ever presidential debate. Who will emerge the first president of the Second Republic? Welcome to the Kenya Presidential Debate 2013. Your hosts, Linus Kaikai and Julie Kishuru. Good evening, welcome to the first of two presidential debates intended to give you a comprehensive picture of the candidates, their outlook on the issues, their policies and their commitments on the matters that are of greatest concern to this nation. This debate has been organized by the Kenyan media and is coming to you live on all participating television and radio stations across the country. It is also streaming live online for the global audience. The next two hours are unprecedented in the history of Kenyan elections. For the first time ever, presidential candidates have together agreed to submit themselves to a debate on relevant issues and pertinent national issues. Eight of the presidential candidates are here tonight to debate each other before an audience. The audience will maintain silence throughout the debate, except a few moments from now when we will put our hands together to welcome the 2013 presidential candidates one by one. Well, earlier, the Kenya Presidential Debates Steering Committee conducted a balloting session with the candidates to determine their order of entrance tonight and the podium position for each candidate. It's time now to welcome the presidential candidates. And tonight, we begin with Mohamed Abdubadida from, from the Alliance for Real Change Party. Let's give him a round of applause. We will ask you to take take the front of the stage for the moment. Please do come forward. Stand in front of the right, right podium. there. Thank you yeah, so next much. Next to your podium. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we welcome the second candidate tonight in order of balloting again, and that is Professor James Olekiyapi of the Rebuild and Restore Kenya Party, RBK. <laughs> And next, we have Uhuru Kenyatta from TNA, which is part of the Jubilee Alliance. Let's give him a round of applause. And next on stage tonight, we do have the presidential candidate of the Kenya National Congress, and that is the Honorable Peter Kenneth. Also with us tonight, we have Musalia Mudavadi from UDF, part of the Amani Alliance. Let's give him a round of applause as well. And 
And now let's welcome to the stage the only female presidential candidate in this race, Martha Karua of the NAC Kenya Party. Also with us tonight, Raila Odinga of ODM, part of the Cord Alliance. And finally, the last candidate coming in tonight, the Honorable Paul Muite of the Safina Party. Welcome to you all, a list of eight presidential candidates taking part in this debate tonight. And the debate will focus on broad thematic areas of governance, security, and social services. Each candidate will be expected to explain their position in two minutes and will be given additional time for rebuttals. The rules of engagement discussed and agreed by each candidate requires them to treat and address each other with respect. Now, this debate has two main segments, part one, which is focused on governance, and part two, which includes questions from the audience. We thank you all for joining us, making time for this debate tonight. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, let us all be upstanding for the national anthem. It is performed tonight by Carol Atemi. Thank you. You may take your seats and the presidential candidates, you may take your stands at the podiums. At this point, I hand over to Linus Kaikai to take us through part one of this crucial debate. Thank you very much and thank you once again, candidates, and welcome again to this debate. 
The first part is about self-introduction. We're not going into policies, we're just going into self-introduction. And this is your moment to do what you don't get to do in rallies. Tell us about yourself for 30 seconds. Who are you and what is your strength? And in order of the ballot again, we will start with the candidate for the Alliance for Real Change, Mr. Abdul Badida. Thank you so much. My name's uh, Mohammed Abdul Badida. And I usually like using the title Mwalimu because I'm professionally trained and it is a noble profession, so I'm proud of it. Uh, I'm vying for the presidency, as you very well know, and my political party that nominated me is Alliance for Real Change, abbreviated ARK. Most of the media and many people mistake it for ARC, but the K is as by it appears. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dida. That is, uh, you have only 30 seconds to introduce yourself. Let's go to candidate on platform or podium number two. I'm James Olekiyapi, and I've been a public official for 20 years, and I am very grateful to God today that I am here as one of the presidential candidates on this historic day in the Republic of Kenya. Good evening, viewers, and I'm glad to be with you. Thank you, Professor Kiyapi. Let's go to candidate on platform podium number three. Good evening, everybody. My name is Uhuru Kenyatta. I'm a proud Kenyan who has been in public service and as a politician for the last 15 years. I'm a husband, a father, and a person who is greatly committed to this country and who seeks to be given the opportunity to make my contribution to this country through the election um, that is due in the next few weeks. Thank you, Honorable Kenyatta. Next candidate on podium number four. Thank you for having me here tonight. I am bothered by what I see as lack of basic facilities for our people. I'm here tonight because we must fix security, sort out infrastructure, fix water and sanitation, fix health care, and reform our educational system. We must grow our economy. I believe I have something unique to offer our country in terms of leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is a moment of self-introduction. So you confirm that you are Peter Kenneth. Had already, you had already said it. That, that's right. To. Let's go to the next candidate's platform, number five. I am Musalia Mudavadi. I'm the UDF presidential candidate in the Amani coalition. I wish to present myself to the Kenyan people so that I can serve them as the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya. I'm also pleased that I am part of this historic moment so that Kenyans can listen to us and evaluate us from a different perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Mudavadi. Candidate on number six. I'm Martha Karua, a mother, recently a grandmother. I grew up and did my early schooling in my home county, Kirinyaga. And thanks to my parents and the community around me, I learned the values of honesty, hard work, and community that is caring for others, values that have stood me in good stead today. You can trust that the promises I make to you will be delivered. I'm a woman of her own word. Thank you, Honorable Karua. Candidate number seven tonight. Good evening, viewers. My name is Raila Amolo Odinga. I'm an engineer by profession and the current prime minister. I am happy that this event is taking place today. History is being made. For the first time, presidential candidates are facing Kenyans to tell them what they want to do for them. I hope that this is now a step towards realizing the Kenyan dream as coined by the founding fathers of our nation which is in our national anthem. I am going to spend time to tell thank Kenyans. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very win. much. Thank you very much, Honorable Bodinga. We go to candidate number eight. You have my, 30 seconds to tell us about yourself, who you name, are, and indeed, what is your strength? My name is Paul Moite, a lawyer by profession. 
1990, as chair of the Law Society, I was one of those who started on this journey towards a realization of the new constitution which, which we now have. Not as a NED in itself, but a means to a NED. I'll be talking a little later about that end. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all candidates for introducing yourself. We're now going straight to the issues. And uh, we had indicated to you the broad thematic, thematic areas, uh, governance, <coughs> national security, and social services. And I want us to begin with the single most serious problem in this country, the cancer that afflicts the politics, the elections, and governance in this country, the problem of tribalism or ethnicity. Let's hear from each candidate for two minutes what your appreciation of the problem is and what you intend to do and how different you'll be from the predecessors of the president we are seeking to elect. That is Jomo Kenyatta, Daniel Arap Moy, and Mwai Kibaki, all who made tribe the base of their governments. Let's start with um, Mr. Dida. Thank Two you minutes. so much. I think uh, governance uh, is actually the most crucial issue that contributed to the failure of this nation. And uh, the only way out is uh, full implementation of the Constitution. Mr. Dida, let me remind you, we're talking about tribalism. What is your appreciation of the problem, and what do you intend to do to be different from the previous presidents of this country? Well, uh, Kenyans, 90% of Kenyans are actually defeated by their own systems of life. And this issue of tribalism is a factor contributed by 5% of each community leaders who want to connect to the leading class. So when, if this issue of governance is sorted out and the constitution is fully implemented and everybody has his right, nobody will rush to the other because every Kenyan will have his, his or her own right. So it is a problem currently biting because of the current economic and social situation in the country. If governance is corrected, then that is a forgotten story. It will go. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dida. Two minutes for Professor Kiyapi. I just want to start at the outset by saying all Kenyans are born equal, irrespective of which part of the country. And I know that this country is enough for all of us. The reason why tribalism is a problem to us is because leaders have used it as a means of allocating resources and positions and therefore marginalizing others, marginalizing other Kenyans. If our leaders and if today we would promise and commit to ourselves that we will share national resources equitably and that everybody is given a fair chance in life, then I don't have any reason to believe that Kenyans really hate each other that much because we grew, we went to the same schools, I myself went to Alliance High School and I was the only Maasai boy in Form 1, but nobody looked at me as different. So I believe that it is the leadership that must address this issue. And you haven't told us, you have a minute to go of your time, you haven't told us what you intend to do as president. To what I want to do as president is that I want a government of inclusion, a government where every Kenyan, irrespective of where they are, will look at those ministers those permanent secretaries, those uh, ambassadors. They will, it will be done fairly and on merit. I want also a government that will share national resources fairly and equitably and in a way that all Kenyans feel that this is their country, because it is their country. Thank you very much. Let's go to Honorable Kenyatta. You are appreciation of the problem of tribalism and how different you intend to be from the past three presidents. Thank you. Let me begin by saying that tribalism is a cancer that has afflicted this country for a very long time, and has been a source of conflict, has been a source of death, has been a source of destruction of property. And this we saw the worst of in the post-election violence of 2007. I personally believe that this problem is largely associated as a result of the battle for resources. And in the past, what we have seen is a position where Positions of leadership go, and people are made to assume that if your community is in leadership, 
therefore you will be entitled to a greater share of the cake. We have a new constitution now. That new constitution is very clear on what it requires of all of us as Kenyans. My job as president is to ensure that that constitution is implemented, but furthermore, to ensure that through devolution, something that I have tried practically when I was in the Ministry of Finance, we ensure that resources are distributed accordingly to every part of this country and ensure that the government that we form is an inclusive government that will ensure that every single Kenyan feels part and parcel of that government. Just 45 seconds of your time are still on and I would like to hear from you where the link is between a new constitution and the eradication of tribalism. First and foremost, I think the constitution is now very clear and there are very clear guidelines as to what politicians can say, especially during their campaigns. The use of ethnicity as a card in the campaign is something that the constitution, for example, does not recognize anymore. So therefore, what has been happening in the past where you've had politicians saying or accusing communities, that isn't there. The hate speech that we have seen in the past, now we have laws that clearly control and ensure that that kind of language isn't allowed on any political platform. We cannot incite one another, we have to offer what it is our policies are that ensure that we eradicate poverty and deal with the real issues that are of concern to Kenyans. Thank you, Honorable Kenyatta. Honorable Peter Kenneth, your appreciation of tribalism? Yes, I grew up in this city, on the Eastlands part of it, specifically in Bahati, where all communities were represented and there was no tribalism. I had the opportunity to go to the Stare Boys Center where again was all communities represented. So I've not seen effect in my upgrowing of tribalism. Tribalism is an excuse that poor leadership and weak leadership gives to Kenyans. We come in and practice tribalism because we feel that if it is practiced, then that community A, where I come from, will benefit. We were never taught tribalism in primary. We never learned it in any institution of learning. It is something to do with leadership, and I'll say poor leadership and weak, le and weak leadership. Now, we have a new constitution. We've always had sets of laws. It is poor enforcement and implementation that continues to drive us to tribalism, because all forms of impunities, if they were dealt with at an efficient space, and speed, we would not have all these levels of impunities. Now, I want to tell you this. In my plan, I have looked at equality, I have looked at equity, so that never again will Kenyans feel they are not equal, never again will Kenyans feel that one side of the country is inferior to the other. And I have to make this absolutely clear, that the fight over resources in my plan comes to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kenneth. We go to Honorable Mudavid, and I want to remind all candidates, you're here to engage each other, and I hope you're listening to each other, because questions will then be coming up after this. Let's go to Honorable Mudavid. Your appreciation of ethnicity, tribalism, and what you intend to do if elected president. Tribalism is real. Uh, it is serious. We can try and uh, parry around it, but the fact of the matter is that tribalism is real. And it comes out because there's a sense of insecurity. The way we have practiced our politics is that we have created a sense of insecurity amongst communities. We have reached a stage where we are telling our community, unless you are herded into one corner, then your interests are not properly taken care of. Now, we have an opportunity as a Kenyan people to be able to break away from this. And this is largely based on the issue of the new constitution. The new constitution, makes it very clear that the way public resources are going to be distributed within the context of devolution, a formula is going to be put in place determined by parliament. At the same time, uh, the constitution makes it very clear that communities that have either to been marginalized must not be marginalized. So the solution lies in implementing the constitution to the letter. The other thing that really comes up is that as we move ahead, it will be very important that we take a public audit of the way our public service, and particularly even within the private sector, is constituting itself. 
Nobody should cheat ourselves. We should not cheat ourselves. It's so clear that if you did an audit, you will find that there are certain favoritisms that have been occurring in the appointment of public officers, and indeed, even within the private sector, where the shareholders, being based from one particular community, tend to favor people of their community. This must stop. Thank you, Honorable Mudavari. Let's go to Honorable Karua. Your appreciation of the problem of ethnicity and what you would tend to do if elected president. Tribalism is a social and economic issue. More about perceptions and also about how resources are distributed. In every ethnic community, we have a section of the poor. In some areas, more than in others. But there is no single ethnic community that does not have poor and desperate people. So it is the perception that because you're from community X, you have no problem, others are the ones having a problem. I think it's perpetuated more by leadership. We have to own up as leaders, take responsibility, and lead people out of this. How I will deal with it as president? One is to ensure that we equalize all the areas in terms of development or bring them to as near as possible. And that is not just through the devolved funds, it's by deliberately giving more funds to areas that have been hitherto marginalized. When our development across the country, across the 47 counties, is as nearly as equal as possible, Nobody will listen to leadership talking about tribalism. But now the desperation leads people to believe that a person from your ethnic group will do better. Secondly, it will be through public education. Nobody gets their food every day from their tribe. It's from their sweat of their brow. And when a citizen is sleeping hungry, their tribe or the leader from their tribe is not with them. It's that person and their God. Therefore, we ought to unite together to develop our country, but as a leader, I'll lead from the front. And I'll ensure that in my government, there is inclusion, both in cabinet and in other jobs, as we fight this court. Thank you very much. Let's go to Honorable Dinga. Well, uh, Linus, uh, uh, ethnicity is a disease of the elite. The elite who are in competition for the resources in the country resort to ethnicity as an ideology. Uh, when Kenyans were fighting for independence, they were so united. The, Kenyan, the movement for independence was very united. Ethnicity reared its ugly head immediately after independence when the nationalist movement split. The, the elites started to coerce leadership for uh, allocation of resources. Down the road next door in Tanzania, Malimu Nyerere introduced a very unifying uh, ideology that united the people of Tanzania. We now have a legal framework to deal with this animal that is called uh, ethnicity by ensuring that there is equity in allocation of resources in our country. If we faithfully implement this new constitution, then we'll be able to realize the Kenyan dream of our founding fathers, that is Kenya for all, not for just a few elites, by ensuring that all parts of the country get equity in terms of allocation of resources, that we promote education for all our children, that um, every Kenyan has access to Medicare, that uh, all the social amenities are available to everybody, but most importantly, that people are united at the national level. When somebody goes on a national screen, and we flounce ethnic figures to say that because our candidates come from these communities, because of this, this election has already been won at the time of registration, it is a very dangerous proposition because it basically rubbishes the other communities. We in court know that we have a solution to this problem. And your time is up. Let's go to Honorable Moite. I would begin by saying we need to accept we are 30, 42 different ethnic communities in Kenya, speaking different mother tongues. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that because all these 42 communities are human beings with the same aspirations, same needs, and what have you. It is negative ethnicity that is a problem. And that comes about because of the high levels of poverty in this country, 
because of corruption, because of impunity. So people feel insecure and wrongly believe that they can only advance economically and socially if one of their own is in power. How would Safina tackle this problem? It would tackle this problem by rearranging the economic social problem so as to target the majority poor, like harvesting rainwater from Pokot through to Turukana, everywhere, including Masaini. So as to give opportunity, we can grow everything. Let's start with the basics. Let us begin by feeding ourselves adequately, because it is a shame that every three, four years we have to go begging food, and yet we can feed ourselves. Let us invest in agriculture, research, so as to come up with high-yielding seed varieties from cotton to maize to everything, value-adding to what we propose. I think if people felt economically secure, they would think less and less of their ethnic communities because everybody needs the same things. Thank you. Now, candidates, viewers watching you at home and even here in the audience, having listened to your opening statements on ethnicity, would then wonder why some things are done this, the way they're done. And I want to refer all of you, and some of you specifically, to campaigns, current campaigns. None of you have referred to the campaigns, and I want to refer you to, to that. Campaigns have taken the shape of a contest between tribes, or blocks of tribes. I want to specifically put on the spot Cod, uh, the Honorable Dinga, and Jubilee, the Honorable uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, to immediately, right now, uh, respond to that perception that both of you are indeed leading tribes or blocks of tribes and specifically against each other. Starting with Honorable Uhuru. Uh, thank you very much. Let me say this. Our Jubilee platform is a platform that has been built on issues. If you have followed and listened to the speeches that we have made with my running mate, um, the Honorable William Ruto, throughout the country, we have emphasized the need for us to be able to focus on the real issues that affect our people. Unemployment, poverty, the social infrastructure, the need for us to be able to pull together as Kenyans, the need for us to be able to be united and understanding that the best way to deal with our problems is not for leaders to be pulling apart, but working together. Despite our own personal differences, we need to pull together. Now, it is indeed true that numbers are being bandied around. But those numbers, if you look, are largely also being bandied around by the political analysts who are out there. Just as there's language that is also... But, but, but would you admit, Honorable Kenyatta, that your campaign revolves around the Kikuyu and Kalenjin communities? I would completely disagree. If you would look at where we have had all our rallies so far, I have not had a single rally yet in um, Central Province since I was uh, nominated. We have been campaigning in the Coast Province. We have been campaigning up in Meru. We were in Rift Valley the, the other day. We're moving on to uh, um, um, Lower Eastern, where we intend to be. So we've been up to Korea. So we, we are actually conducting a national campaign, a campaign that is aimed at bringing all Kenyans together with a purpose right. of bringing, forming a government that right. will be all-inclusive and that will deal with the real issues that face common one in this Bringing country. Kenyans together, Honorable Kenyatta, and when you were in uh, Meru last month, you asked, when you asked a certain region not to divide their vote, what do you mean? Well, what I am saying is if we understand and we are moving on the same platform, we saw a situation where, for example, you have a number of candidates um, in a particular constituency, all saying they support the same presidential candidate, but yet they are on different platforms. And I said, if we really want to implement the agenda that we have, given our new constitution, given the strength uh, and the powers that have been given to parliament, if we don't have the necessary numbers in Parliament to implement our agenda, it is going to make it difficult. So I was saying, if you have two or three or four candidates claiming to support me, then I say, then we need to be in one party so that we can implement the agenda and the promises that we're making in Parliament. We'll come back to you, the Honorable Kenyatta. Let me go to Honorable Odinga. And I want to take you back to 2002, 2005, 2007, and now. Your politics revolve 
around building or getting appointment from tribes. I'm talking about a summit, 2002. I'm talking about the Orange Campaign uh, against the new constitution in 2007. I'm also talking about the Pentagon in uh, 2007. And now, lately, you talk of a triangle, all made up of point men from regions. Isn't this tribalism, Mr. Odinga? First, you know, uh, Kenyans must come from certain regions. They cannot be invented from the moon. So uh, people come together for a particular purpose. Like now, we have got COD. It's a coalition of the willing. People who have come together because of certain values that they share together. In 2002, that was the third time that the position was going for an election. Remember, we lost in 92. We lost also again in 97. So in 2002, we decided to come together and rally behind one person. And that's why I said Kibaki Tosha. That was to unite the people of Kenya, to unite the, the people said the Luos could not vote for Kibaki because it was a Kikuyu, and no Luo can vote for a Kikuyu. I said, Kikuyus are Kenyans, and uh, there was never a war between Luos and Kikuyus. And I managed to ca campaign for Kibaki, that Kibaki got majority of votes. You need to know that James Orengo, a Luo, was also a presidential candidate in 1992. That, that was 2002. 2002. That was 2002, Honorable yes. but isn't it true that in the 2005 and 2000 votes, your mathematics was a simple 41 minus 42 minus 1. And you know what I mean? That, I, that is a creation of the media. Nowhere did anybody talk about 41 versus 1. That was actually a propaganda. We talked of uniting all the people of Kenya. And we were running against an incumbent who happened to come from one particular community. But ODM was basically a national movement of, which brought in the communities from all over the country, like God today. God is a national movement which has brought Kenyans of all walks of life, different communities. And we have never talked about ethnicity. It is our opponents who are being ethnic figures to try to intimidate the other communities by saying that, oh, this election has already been won because the candidate and his running mate come from this community and so many are the votes which are registered in this community. We are saying that basically misses the point. The point is that every Kenyan matter, whether it's an Elmolo, the smallest tribe, or a Kikui, the biggest tribe, let us work together to unite the people of this country. This is what God stands for. One Kenya, one nation, for all, for all. And I'm going to the rest of the candidates now, and, but before I go there, still to Uhuru and uh, Raila, the question of the rivalry between the Kikuyu and the Luo communities, which is at the epicenter of the Kenya's ethnicity problem. Um, there are people who view you, a lot of people view you as taking it on from where your fathers left it. Jomo Kenyatta and Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, both of you uh, picking it up from 69. Uh, Uhuru. Kenya has come a long way since then. And I, I want to remind those Kenyans who maybe have that feeling that uh, they just need to look back into recent history. You know, as late as 1997, we were together with the Honorable Raila in the uh, Kano government. And we campaigned together until the time of uh, um, Kasarani. We parted ways and he went to support um, Waikibaki. Soon thereafter, the 2005 referendum, again, we campaigned on the same platform and he led the no campaign uh, for the constitution at the time. And I supported him and campaigned throughout the country. So personally, I have no differences with the Honorable Raila. Um, I see him as a colleague, I see him as a brother, but we may differ on um, how to handle some of the issues that face this country. And I think that is why we have elections, so that the people of Kenya are given an opportunity to choose between the candidates. Honorable Odinga. No, I basically agree totally with my brother, Uhuru Kenyatta. We have nothing personal be between each one of us. In fact, we are best of friends. And you remember, if you go down the memory lane, my father spearheaded the, the, the struggle for release of Jomo Kenyatta from prison. Uh, he was a Luo, Kenyatta was a Kikuyu, but they were united. In 2002, I said Kibaki Tosha. 
Kibaki is a Kikuyu, but I said Kikuyus are Kenyans. So we managed to unite the people behind him. We disagreed on the issue of MOU and on the Constitution. And on that issue of the Constitution, me and my brother Huru Kinyata were on the same side. We campaigned for a no, and that's where the orange was born uh, against the, the uh, uh, banana. But now we want to see that um, Kenyans make an informed choice on basis of policies. The Jubilee has got a policy document. Court has got a policy document. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Dinga. And I want to bring in the rest of the candidates now on this issue of ethnicity, particularly what is emerging tonight and generally that greater responsibilities lies with Court and Jubilee on the question of ethnicity. And I want to bring in uh, Martha Karua. What I would like to say is that Kenyans can hear for themselves today, the leaders denying that there's no tribal overtones. Kenyans are the judges. And I would like to tell Kenyans that there's no difference between a poor law, a poor Kikuyu, a hungry member of any tribe, and we are better off uniting and fighting together to liberate ourselves from hunger, to liberate ourselves from uh, lack of access to medical services to get ourselves better education. We are better united and following the denial because no politician will admit they are peddling tribalism. Following our denials here, my urging to Kenyans, please do not allow us to mislead you. No tribe puts food on your table. It is you, your God, and the opportunities that you have. Why don't we join hands to create opportunities for every Kenyan? I look forward to the day that our laws will be properly applied so that any leader who makes speeches that are inciting ethnicity, irrespective of their social standing, is actually made to account under our laws. Thank you very much. And now for the remaining candidates, I'll give them 30 seconds each, starting with uh, the Honorable Mudavadi. Uh, your, your campaign also is seen to be focusing on Western Kenya only. No, I think you've got it wrong. That is absolutely false because we are traversing <coughs> the entire country. We are campaigning in the entire country. A few days ago, I was in the coastal region and I intend to go to other parts of the country so, and in Nairobi. So that is not true. But I stand here in a very unique position. I'm one of the few people standing here today who has supported Uhuru for the presidential candidate in 2002 and supported Honorable Raila as a president in 2007 elections. So clearly, from that perspective, the tag of tribalism should be distanced from me. Thank you very much. Honorable Kenneth. Well, I'm very surprised tonight because we are being economical with truth. We need to look at the Kenyans right straight into the eye. We have wiped tribal emotions since we became a multi-party state. That's why we have hundreds of Kenyans in IDP camps. It is tribal emotions. And this is why we must now start discussing issues. We must start being realistic. We now must start thinking that we must elect what is right, not what is convenient. We must break away the historical bondage that we've been tied to in the last 50 years. Thank, thank you, uh, Kenneth. And let's go to Professor Kiyapi. Uh, Professor Kiyapi, you come from a very small tribe and you're talking about big numbers, big ethnic numbers. Do you think you count? I count because I believe that the Kenyan, some many, many Kenyan people are also tired of what I'm tired of. And I want to say this. The formula in Kenya since 1960s has always been near election time, the leaders who want power, and there's nothing wrong getting power, must always sit down and look at the ethnic arithmetic, and then you know which block you can pull. And in between, the nation will be and has been divided right down the middle. And I think that was the reason that informed RBK, my party, Restore and Build Kenya to resist the temptation to be part of blockings that will continue to divide Kenya. And it doesn't matter how long it will take, we will pursue that philosophy that we want a country that is one and united in every way, including in our own party. Thank you. Thank you very much. We need to move to the next uh, topic, but uh, Dida, on the question of uh, 
ethnicity that we're discussing here? Yeah, this uh, issue of fear, insincerity, and betrayal that these leaders may swallow us started in 1965 when Kadu was formed. Uh, one stylistic device that was, is commonly used in the Kenyan administrative system is irony, where you talk exactly opposite of what you mean. And uh, it has gone, now it is dramatic. Who were the leaders for all those times when we are discussing tribalism in the 21st century? Who are those who were in the box leading? The same, same leaders are trying to, you know, if your football team fails scoring or winning and you change your, their uniform, it won't help. Dear Kenyans, listen well and it is up to you to judge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Moita, do you agree that the players are the same, the justices are different? Well, first of all, let me say how pleased I am to hear the right Honorable Prime Minister saying that uh, the mantra of 41 versus 1 was a creation of the media, and the media does very many crimes. But it, it needs to be re, uh, renounced more and more and more. But let us admit that ethnicity is a major challenge in our politics today. Poses a very major challenge. And really, the route to eradicating ethnicity is through um, uh, empowerment, economic and social empowerment. Because every person, irrespective of their tribe, wants adequate clean water, decent housing, access to affordable health care, and so on and so forth. So let us move towards getting Kenyans to ask us as leaders, how are you going to improve my economic social situation rather than vote for me because I come from your tribe? Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to bring this to a conclusion and go to the next question. Um, you may remember from the dailies yesterday, if you had a look at them, there was a caricature of this debate. And right behind you was a huge elephant, a very, very big elephant towering over all the candidates. We want now want to bring the elephant into the room, and that is the ICC question. And I want to begin with uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. Your trial for crimes against humanity begins in April. For two minutes, uh, Honorable Kenyatta, provide the public with a clear plan of how you intend to govern if elected president and at the same time attend trial as a crimes against humanity suspect? Uh, thank you. And I have said this severally. First and foremost, the issue of the uh, crimes that we are accused of. We have not been found guilty in any way whatsoever. This is an ongoing case and we and my deputy have made it very clear that it is indeed our intention to follow the process through and to ensure that we clear our names. At the same time, we are offering ourselves in a position of leadership in this country, a position that we believe and we want to pass on to Kenyans, an agenda that will first and foremost ensure that the kind of things that caused the problems of 2007 are put to an end and to really be able to focus on the critical issues that face the people of Kenya. As I have said, the issue of poverty, the issue of unemployment, lack of basic services. And it is on that platform that we are campaigning. Uh, now, like with everybody else, and it, I want to, it, I'm it, getting there, with, it, like with everything clarity. else. We need some clarity, Honorable Kenyatta. Yes. The mm. question is, how will you govern if elected president, in the first round, for example, your trial is in April. I was getting to that point, and what I was saying is that the way it currently is, many Kenyans are faced with personal challenges, and I take this as a personal challenge. I'm sure that my colleagues here also have other challenges, but those challenges do not prevent one from continuing with their day-to-day -day job. If the people of Kenya do decide to vote for me as their president, I will be able to handle the issue of clearing my name while at the same time ensuring that the business of government continues, our manifesto and our agenda for Kenya is implemented, and furthermore, even if we look at the um, current situation, the ICC itself, in recognition of the fact that there may be this issue, are even saying we can move this case closer by. In two days' time, 
and we are in the middle Thank of you. a campaign. Yeah, we you. will be having a status conference. That status conference will be handled through video conferencing. The business of you government will of not end. Kenyatta, just a moment, uh, uh, Mr. Dida, you have you want to interject on this? Yeah. Sure, go ahead. According to That's the culture of justice, if you are found suspected of a crime, the norms that we had is you step aside until you are cleared. If, if there is no, nothing with you and you are found not guilty, then you resume your, your office. Why is it different with, this, with Uhuru and uh, his friends? Okay, Honorable Kenyatta. Let me state this. The position I am looking for is an elective position, not an appointive position. The position I seek is given by the people of Kenya through their democratic, which is their democratic right. And it is also my democratic right to present myself to Kenyans. They know full well the issues that I am confronted with. Just if they so choose to elect me, it means they have confidence in my ability to discharge my duties as president while still handling the case that is before me. Thank you. And some of your opponents have raised the ICC issue as an integrity question in the campaign trail. And I want to bring in Martha Karua because you've been on record about the ICC question. Yes, I consider it a matter of display of impunity. Like uh, Mr. Uh, Mike, what the opponent, Mr. Ndida, has indicated, we have laws, the Public Officers Ethics Act. If you're just suspected of crime and you're a public officer, you're supposed to step aside to facilitate investigations. We have another law, the anti-corruption law. It demands if you're a public officer and you're charged with a criminal offense, you actually stand suspended. You have to be suspended pending the outcome. So since the charges were framed, my brother ought to have uh, been suspended as a deputy prime minister. And if he gets elected president, the question is, are you going to be suspended before taking off or after taking off? Any Kenyan can go to court to challenge the position in office because our, as our law stands, there is that hurdle. Yeah. And Kenyatta has a right of reply to your remarks. Yeah. I want to be very clear again. The job that I seek is going to be given by the people of Kenya. The people of Kenya who full well know the personal issues that I am confronted with. If they so desire to still give me that job, and it is indeed my hope that they will, it means they have the confidence in my capacity to discharge my duties as president while still proceeding to clear my name. Secondly, I think we need to distinguish between an appointed position, of which that is not what I'm seeking, and an elective one. An elective one, not with anything hidden, but with Kenyans knowing full well the charges that are before me. So therefore, as far as I am concerned, and there is a case already in court, and I do believe that case will be heard, I think it's this week, and um, the issue of the integrity question will be, without a doubt, resolved. And I'll give the rest of the candidates 30 seconds, uh, starting with Peter Kenneth on the same issue. Yes. First of all, I voted for the local tribunal, and we didn't succeed because I also feel we have put too much concentration on the four indicted persons. And we have many Kenyans out there who are still languishing in very poor situations arising from that event of the last election. For me, I would go with the presumption of innocence until proved guilty. I would like to defeat my brother in a proper electoral process rather than have him eliminated so that we can square the ball out squarely. But I also want to say this. Article 10 of our Constitution on National Values and Chapter 6 are very key. And we need to address them even as we address the issue of ICC. Thank you. Honorable Mudavadi. Yes, I think um, this is a very uh, delicate matter for the people of Kenya. Uh, one of the important things that uh, we must figure out is that as we try to come to the next election, what is the destiny of the Kenyan nation? This is absolutely essential uh, when we are conducting ourselves and conducting our politics. Nobody 
should actually be facing trial outside Kenyan soil. That is something I believe in, and that is something I also voted for. But are you then so that we had a we wanted a local tribunal. But the point I'm trying to make here, and I want to make it very quickly, is that there are definitely implications on how the Kenyans will conduct their vote. This is something that we have to grapple with. They have a freedom to make the choice, but we are seeing dangerous signals that need to be thought through by the Kenyan people. But, but five of you here were in that cabinet that failed to bring the trials to Kenya, make it a local process. Are you then admitting failure of leadership on your part? We are not admitting failure of leadership on our part. I think we are dealing with a situation where people did not understand a situation at that particular moment in time. And I want to say that I, and indeed some of the people who are here, fought so forcefully to have this matter handled through a local uh, mechanism. But there was also an equally potent member of our parliament, potent members of our parliament, who thought that they would rather have this thing handled outside. And they carried the day at that time. But on this one, I can tell you that quite a number of us stood for a local mechanism. Right. Honorable Odinga? Every Kenyan knows how I stood on this particular matter. Kofi Annan actually warned us about the Hague. And me and President Kibaki spent nearly eight hours in Parliament trying to convince our colleagues to vote for a local tribunal. Unfortunately, two of our colleagues who are now in the Hague are the ones who led the campaign against a local tribunal. Uh, unfortunately, I am the one who is now being accused of having taken people to the Hague because nothing could be further from the truth. I do not want to eliminate any kind of competition. That's why I would rather have my brother on the ballot. But I know that it will pose serious challenges to run a government by Skype from the Hague. I know that it is, it is, it is, it is not, not, not practical. Thank you. Honorable Moita. My plea is to spare thought for the victims, the 1,300 people, Kenyan people, innocent, who were murdered, who were killed leaving behind relatives, the many women and men who were raped. Let us bear a thought for the victims. Let us also agree that we cannot continue with a culture of impunity. But having said that, the way to tackle the issue of impunity is to go to the highest levels where it is to be found. And I must say that as a lawyer, having read the Rome Statute, I know because the ICC cannot handle the cases of everybody or accused persons, jurisdiction is limited to those holding the highest responsibility. A Safina government would revisit the issue of jurisdiction. The Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, and he has not asked me to hold his brief, was not a presidential candidate. If you are going to charge six people, you must begin with number one, number two, to number six. You cannot begin with three, four, five, and six. And I wonder, whether there was blinking on the part of the office of the prosecutor. The Safina government would like to revisit that so that those holding the highest responsibility perhaps go to the dock there, the others can be dealt with here in accordance with the law. Are, are you talking about presidential candidates and therefore the colleague to your right, Raila Odinga, it should be in the list? Well, two people were presidential candidates. It is impossible, you cannot persuade my mind or the minds of many rational people that the two candidates did not know about it. It's only these other four Kenyans who are facing the charges there and the two candidates did not have a clue about it. That is an issue I would want to see investigated. As a Safina government, we would revisit that issue. Honorable Dinga, your response to that? That is a most irresponsible statement that ever was ever made. Because my friend needs to know that investigation was carried out by a commission which was appointed through the Serena process led by Justice Waki, which then produced the list of names which were handed over to Kofi Annan, who was the leader of the process. And then that list was handed over to Mr. Campo. Me, I don't fear because I have nothing to hide. I know exactly what I did. 
and I know that I was not responsible, and I would be very willing to go to, to The Hague if only Mitty would want to take me there. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, Martha. I just wanted to disprove that the two principles actually pushed for the local tribunal. I was Minister of Justice then. The entire cabinet passed the bill, but when I reached parliament, they left me with the baby. The two principles, in spite of my pleas to them, failed to come and persuade members. They merely came to vote, and in their full view, there was rebellion, cabinet pushing people to vote, to refuse to vote for the lo local tribunal. So to put the record straight, the two principles did not stand in parliament and persuade their troops to vote for the local tribunal. And one of the principles is here, right? Right Odinga. here with us. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I really just want to jog the uh, memory of my dear sister here. Mm. That first we had a PG, a joint PG meeting of PNU and ODM, mm. co-chaired by President Baki and myself in the old chambers, mm. pleading with the members to agree to vote for the local tribunal. This is on record, um, uh, even the answer to bear us out, that we tried as much to persuade all the members to vote for a local tribunal. But the clarion call was, don't be vague. Let us go to the Hague, unfortunately. But, but Prime Minister, why is it very difficult for a lot of people to believe your position on the ICC question? The common uh, perception is you put a front that looks like you support a local process when indeed you wanted your opponents out of the country? In fact, uh, Linus, we first set up a cabinet committee on ICC, chaired by the late Professor Saitoti. I think that was the former Attorney General. There was also uh, the, um, Tula Kilonzo, James Orengo, um, Amazon Kingi, uh, and so on. They went first to, to Geneva, then they went to The Hague, where Mr. Campo told him, he was not interested in coming to Kenya. If Kenyans can agree to set up a local tribunal, the ICC would not get involved. So we tried everything possible. The second time we went to the cabinet, when Martha had already resigned from the government, it was shot down in the cabinet. And the two who are now in The Hague led the campaign in the cabinet to shoot down the proposal to set up a local tribunal. Yeah, finally on this question. Okay, Honorable Kenyatta. I think there's a discrepancy there because he just said cabinet passed it. It was rejected on the floor of parliament. So we couldn't have led an onslaught in cabinet because I think we were all together in cabinet. We approved it. And on the floor, I think Martha is quite correct that um, on the floor there was complete confusion. There was no guidance. And as many members of the ODM team, as many members of the PNU disagreed with the position. So it was not. Uh, as uh, my brother Ryla would put it, that he mobilized his troops to vote for a local process because his own troops rebelled on that particular position with regard to this document. 30 seconds. No, the, the troops that rebelled from ODM are troops who were loyal to my friend William Ruto and whom he had told to vote against it. <laughs> and the troops who were loyal to me voted for a local tribunal uh, to be set up here. But then I was saying that the second, there was a second attempt after Mata had resigned from the government by Mutula Kilonzo. He redrafted the bill, brought it to the cabinet. It was not approved. It was rejected in the cabinet through the intervention of my friends. Are you satisfied with that? Uh, I, think, I think the Hansard record and voting record will prove that it was actually not that way. Thank you. Professor Kiyapi? I, I wanted to make two points. Uh, and the first one is that it doesn't really matter now what we did or didn't do. The, the judicial process at The Hague is on. And for me, the question Kenyans must ask and the answers must be given is whether or not uh, my brother here should run for president. And that can be given by our courts. And if our courts fail to give the answer, he himself can give the answer by saying, I'll step aside in view of this until I clear myself and I don't want to engage the country in this matter. And if he himself, of course, refuses to do that, then he has actually put the ball to the Kenyan people that he's running and let the Kenyan people decide. 
Absolutely. And I think it's very, very important uh, as a country that we don't continue to always bury our hair. Thank you. Thank society. you, Professor Kiapi. Your time is up. Let me go back to Martha. Your hand was up. I just wanted to remind my worthy uh, colleague here, Honorable Raila, there was no vote on the local tribunal because for a constitutional debate, you need 148 members. Those who didn't want a local tribunal literally whipped people out of parliament. I was left there pleading for them to come back. So there was no vote. Now, finally, in closing this matter, uh, uh, did I'll come back to you, but uh, on a different issue, totally on the same. Um, just in closing that particular issue of the ICC, all of you are presidential candidates, and each one of you stands a chance of being next president. And just looking at what the ICC question has done to the country, the exchange with li diplomats, and the perception that local systems don't work. That is why some of the Kenyans ended up in The Hague. What do you feel about this? Because there are Kenyans who are embarrassed about this, uh, starting with Lida. 30 seconds, please, and please keep to your time. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you are taken for justice, whether to Tanzania or Europe or here in Kibera. Justice is justice, unless you have intentions to compromise. But I just wanted to advise Kenyans and the leaders, personally, my personal view about ICC will need some time. But what I'm saying is, if anybody is not comfortable with the idea, then you need to give up and just give room. Listen, you know, Kenya is not an island. The outside world is speaking, Kenyans are speaking, unless, unless a leader is saying, I have a numbers in my community, I will look for another community. If I add the two, what, whatever the world says, I will make it. Unless you're thinking like that, it is comfortable. I don't know why a junior clerk should be forced to step aside and a minister should. I don't know, I don't know that disparity. Why, sh why are we given the metallic stand? Is it, is it, is it, is it the Thank same you. thing that we are discussing? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Uh, let's go to <laughs> Professor Kiyab. For me. There are two key things in our country, and one of them is that we must build the capacity of our institutions. We must do that, whether it is the judiciary or parliament, we must build the capacity. But the second and most important is the, we the must... The question, pr Professor, and we have 15 seconds left, is the image of the country as perceived after the ICC question? Yeah, the image of the country is obviously everybody's looking at us because one, we fail to build, to use our own local processes, and now the whole world is wondering how Kenya is going to pull out of this. Thank you. And we need leadership for that. Thank you very much. Uhuru. There was a lot of uh, misgiving, and I think it was uh, that misgiving which was used in the 2007 election that our courts could not be trusted. That is why. Some of us here went to the street. The disrepute of our courts started there. And it caused us a lot of problem, but we now have a new constitution. We want to build on the institutions that we have. We want to build and rebuild the, ju the judiciary to restore confidence in the people with our own uh, judicial system. And that is something that I, as president, will continue to support as I continue because that is the circumstance we find ourselves in, clearing our name through the um, international court where we are currently present. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kenyatta. Uh, Honorable Kenneth. Kenya is greater than all of us. And national interests must prevail over individual interests. And we must ensure that Kenya's best interests are in place. I am saying that because if we do not place Kenya first and we look at our own individualism and look at it and square it out, it will not help Kenya. Kenya will live beyond all of us. Thank you, Honorable Davidi. It uh, definitely puts us in a very um, awkward situation as a, as a nation. And uh, I would say that I would want to appeal to the Kenyans out there that this is not a laughing matter at all. This is indeed a very serious matter. And a serious decision has got to be made because once we get to the ballot, and we hope we all can get to the ballot, you must ask yourself, is your vote a vote that is being cast for, for the Ken Kenyan people, for the nation, or is it simply 
a vote that you're casting for a particular individual. I think all of us will embody will embody certain aspects of nationhood. And I think that is important that it comes out clearly when the voting is done. Thank you. The, the issue is the image of the country. Uh, Honorable Martha Karua. Yes, the image of Kenya definitely suffers, but rightly so, because we have a judiciary that is reforming, but the entire criminal justice system has not been reformed. The judiciary alone cannot make it. We need a reformed prosecutor's office, we need a reformed investigations office and correction services. I would move as president to make sure that the reforms of the criminal justice system are all encompassing so that Kenya never suffers any other time. And let us remember that the IDPs, the victims of the clashes, have not had justice. And justice is key to reconciliation. Thank you very much. Honorable Odinga. Kenya is a sovereign country, a sovereign nation. We discuss our issues not at the behest of the international community. We need to do what we think is right for this country. And people of Kenya should make an informed choice in electing their leadership uh, without uh, interference. But um, I, I believe very strongly that uh, our judiciary right now has the capacity to deal with this issue and give direction to the country. Right. Finally, Honorable uh, Muita. We need to be proud as Kenyans that we have a new progressive constitution, very good constitution, setting up independent institutions and commissions. The challenge is implementing fully and faithfully this new constitution. When we do that, the image of Kenya outside will change automatically. By and large, we got it right with the institution of the judiciary. But the institution of the police is being faced with the challenges. As we are reading, some acrimony between the police service commission, the inspector general, the office of the president, the oversight authority. Something appears not to have gone quite right with the recruitment of those who are serving in the police service commission. So we need to get that right for the judiciary to be effective. But it is humiliating to see ourselves as a nation being talked down to by other nations. But it is because of corruption, impunity, failure of leadership, and the begging culture. If we can stand on our own, economically and socially, we shall be respected and we shall not be talked down to. Right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to close the issue of ICC and move to the final issue of uh, uh, this part, part one of the presidential debate. And the issue now is on party politics. If we don't get the construction or the foundation right, you can't expect to get right the rest of the structure. And I want to go to the issue of political parties right now. What are you as party flag bearers doing to make sure that the country departs from the culture of temporary political parties that are formed and disbanded? They are formed shortly before the election and then disbanded uh, thereafter. Um, Dida, we're hearing of the Alliance for Real Change for the first time. Uh, most people will tell you that. How many minutes do I have? One minute. Please. Yeah, Alliance for Real Change is a product of the new constitution and uh, is the voice of the hopeless. Uh, what we have in mind is uh, working with the registrar political parties, the IABC, to ensure that the code of conduct and uh, peace prevails in this nation. But are, are you concerned that it, it just came up the other day when you are presenting your papers that there is a party called... When a Alliance? teacher yes. moves, you know, I was teaching 40 students in a class, and whatever message I was giving the students, I realized the 40 million Kenyans are lacking in the same... So I, I just expanded my class. I just want to teach the 40 million Kenyans that, uh, you know, we cannot survive on hide and games. You cannot, you, cannot, you cannot cry when people are crying. You go and you laugh when people are laughing. We need to be principled. And uh, all what we are saying is just the contrary of what we do. So I tried, uh, we, tr we registered this party to clean up the le legislature and the executive. But when I saw 
all aspirants, mad of money. I was just gesturing where money is, and I told them we have, because all candidates were, were, were arguing that uh, why, should I, why should I go for a certificate of good conduct, chapter six of the constitution, when it has been scrapped by, by what Kenyans refer to as vultures. So when we realized that, uh, when we realized that uh, the legislator cannot be corrected at this particular time, and then I thought we should, we should base on the executive, and then for the next five years work on how we can, we can, we can work on So how cleaning. old is your party? Yeah. How old is your party? My party, uh, in terms of thoughts, we are very old, because... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank but you in very paper, much. Uh, in paper, uh, Thank you very much. Your time is up. Let's give two minutes to Professor yes, Kiyapi um, to talk about parties. Yes. RBK, Restore and Build Kenya, is a party, it's a grassroots party that we, many of us formed, professionals, people who just wanted to do politics differently. And we were not afraid not to, to be branded as, you know, you know non-status in terms of the political game. But we wanted to stick to the values of restoration, of the values of this country, hope to the, our young people, empowerment to everybody, a party of integrity where leadership can be trusted. And we build this, and I'm very glad because in terms of efficiency of organization, we are actually an example of how a grassroots organization can grow and be something with minimal resources. All of you knew, knew that I was a, a public official, I was a civil servant, I didn't you, have... You, you have 10 seconds, uh, Professor, let me just quickly yes. ask you, if, if you are defeated, if you don't become president, will RBK remain in place? But it is already remaining in place. It refused to join alliances to get lost. So it is a party beyond the election. Thank it's you, a thank party you. of the future. Thank you, Honorable Kenyatta. TNA Jubilee. As uh, many of you know, I was the chairman of Kanu for a good number of years. But after disagreements uh, within the party that we were unable to resolve, I found it necessary to start my own political party in order to be able to group together with other individuals, other like-minded individuals, and to build on a platform where we would have issues drive our agenda. It is unfortunate, but and the Kano party was not willing to open itself up to alliances at that time with other parties, which I thought was necessary. We needed to start reducing the number of parties that we had in order to be able to come up with parties that are able to focus on issues, fewer parties that we can build, strengthen, build structures around. And that is why when we formed our party, immediately we embarked to try and look for partners who we could at least enter in this, into this election uh, with and build on and hopefully merge to create a strong political foundation that would be issue-based and that would be able to survive personalities or individuals for that matter. Thank you very much. Two minutes up. Uh, Honorable Kenneth. Kenya National Congress is one of the oldest parties. It was formed at the advent of multi-party politics in 1992. And I'm hoping that we can develop ideology so that the party can continue surviving as it has survived in the last 20 years and survive many more years thereafter. I was a little disappointed when Parliament passed the party hoping date from October to January 4th. Then again near January 4th, Parliament again shifted the party hoping date to 18th of January. And beyond that, we are aware that the Registrar of Political Parties was still allowing party shift after the 18th of January. It is important that enforcement of rules are clear and that laws that are created are not torpedoed by Parliament. We need a serious Parliament that will stick to the laws that are enacted to protect the gains of political parties. I'll, I'll give you an additional 30 seconds just to explain to viewers and people watching this debate why you would pick a party that is from the days as back as 1992. What ideological link between your thoughts and that of KNC did you follow? You just picked it as a vehicle of the election? No. I actually picked KNC quite about four years ago. And we've been working with the German Foundation to try and create an ideology party-based. And therefore, we've been very, very clear. I do not hold any position. And KNC should survive as it has survived in the last 20 years, and many more years beyond my stay as its party leader for this presidential election. Honorable Mudavadi. Yes, thank you. Your philosophy I on parties. 
I think, I think uh, what we have now is that we will need to relook at the legislation around political parties. Because in, whether we go into the age of the party or not, I think there are some fundamental issues about the law regarding political parties that will need to be looked at. One of the problems that we had towards the end of the last parliament, the 10th parliament, was the crash program of trying to pass so many pieces of legislation, all revolving on matters to do with election. And believe you me, it is better for us to admit that certain pieces of that legislation were not well thought out. Therefore, in my view, if you want to build uh, parties based on ideology, based on a long-term basis, we will need to revisit uh, that legislation. We have seen shifts even during the nomination process. We have to properly democratize our parties, have serious internal democracy in our political parties so that there's sufficient confidence being built with the membership of those parties. So that is what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mudavadi. Honorable Karua, your philosophy on parties. Yeah, parties form government and are supposed to be vehicles of democracy. I believe a government is as good as the political party that forms it. And this is what informed the political parties law 2007, which I tabled when I was minister. Parties are supposed to have an ideology to pull people together. In Na Kenya, we are social democrats. Right from our constitution, it is stated, the issues that matter to us is about social justice, equity, to see that the vulnerable in society are protected, issues of human dignity and inclusivity. And uh, I would say that in, we need, it's unfortunate, the political party's law has not been enforced properly. We need to strengthen the office of the registrar we need to appoint new people as per the constitution, but the blame cannot just go to the registrar. It must go to political party leadership. It is the duty of the leadership to nurture democracy, transparency, and accountability. We do that in NAC Kenya, and we have offices and networks throughout the 47 counties. This is a growing mass movement. Any party that does not practice democracy and accountability like was displayed openly during the nominations, the blame is on the leadership. Thank you very much, Honorable Karua. Now we come to Honorable Odinga. And it's curious to note that for the first time since 1996, when you went to parliament on an NDP ticket having abandoned Ford Kenya, you have not changed parties before this election. It was curious and interesting, and we want to hear what your philosophies on parties, your philosophy on parties is. Well, uh, uh, what happens in society emerging from single party dictatorship? There's always a proliferation of political parties. What happened in Eastern Europe? You saw so many political parties emerge. In Poland, one time, a ballot paper was a, a booklet. Then after that, the parties begin to co coalesce together and then form more coherent movements. This is what happened in this country in the early times of uh, multi-party democracy. We left Fort Kenya, we formed NDP. Then we tried to transform Khan, we formed a, 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 unit, a union, new Khan we called it. We disagreed, we pulled out. We had LDP. We went and formed the NAC as a coalition, but LDP survived. You have 10 seconds to go, uh, Honorable Dinga. Why do you change parties so often? Do you believe changed, in parties? I have not changed parties. This is what I'm trying to say. LDP just changed the name into ODM. It is still the same party. We did not change the party as such. The ODM has remained up to now. What we have done, we have reemerged with the ODM Kenya, which had changed its name to WIPA. And uh, then for the Kenya, we have formed now a coalition that is called CORD. We have a very clear agenda for change and reform. Uh, and our, our ideology is social democracy. And we are saying that we want to transform this country. So we have a very clear ideology. And that is what I've stood for right through. It runs a, a what, what is the ideology? Social democracy. This is my political ideology. And that is right from the days of Ford, then Ford Kenya then uh, NDP, it has never changed. It is the name that has changed. But the principles and the ideologies that I stand for have remained very consistent. So I'm very firm to what I want for this country. Thank you, Honorable Muita. Well, the 
idea behind the Political Parties Act is to implement operationalize articles 91 and 92. The concept of the Constitution, 91 and 92, which anchors political parties in the Constitution, is to assist parties in Kenya to become internally democratic and parties that are founded on ideology. Actually, mobilization along ethnic lines is forbidden, is unconstitutional in terms of Articles 91. So that is what we subscribe for, and the challenge is in implementing Articles 91, 92, and the Political Parties Act. But that has not been done. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, in preparing you for the next session, it's just about to begin. Uh, quick 30 seconds. Yes, Dida. Yeah. Uh, I read in the newspaper, uh, when a society will go for, I don't know whether I can mention the names. It was, they, they, it, 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 I, I'm just, I just caught. When a society goes for Waititu and not Jimna, then there is a problem. Now, when, 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 when somebody started a team of five, and today four are now opposing and you are alone, is there a social democracy in that system? You know, there are some things that are theoretical, but practically you can see this. I'm sorry. Yeah, and that is for party leaders to take uh, that question. I want to come to the final question, uh, which is a security question. Megingo, the island of Megingo, all of you have 30 seconds uh, just to quickly say, is it Kenya, is it in Kenya or not? And if it is, what should you as president do to assure the people of Megingo that they are part of Kenya? Dida, 30 seconds. Just repeat the question, please. Megingo, do you know Megingo Island? Yeah. Is it Kenya? Is it part of Kenya? Well, there is a problem. We just read the, the newspaper and we see governments fighting over it. I think the experts can really give us the clear demarcations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Kiyape? It's a tiny island on Lake Victoria, and really we must get proper facts because otherwise you can polarize regional politics for nothing. Thank you very much, Honorable Kenyatta. Megingo. Megingo is in Kenya. However, the truth of the matter is that there exist disputes as a result of not having clear uh, maps that have been registered at the uh, UN. So I think what needs to be done is for all our, uh, our borders with our neighbors to, access, to embark on an exercise that ensures that uh, we d demarcate all our borders and get these fully registered. I don't think it's a subject to go to war at. I think, and I do believe, through negotiation and discussion with our neighbors, that issue can be resolved. But in the longer term, I think what needs to be done is to ensure that all our, all our boundaries are properly marked out and registered so as to prevent future conflict over boundaries. Thank you. Honorable Kenneth? Any demarcated part of our country must be safeguarded. Not a single inch. Despite the fact that we must practice good neighborhoodness with our countries, not a single inch of Kenya should be inched out to any person. Not any person should take a piece of our part. And I'll be very clear on that. As long as it's demarcated, we must fight for it. We must keep it in our country. Thank you very much. Honorable Mudavadi. Migingo is in Kenya. And all we need to do is to make sure that the instruments that deal with our external boundaries are properly registered both within the United Nations system and equally within the African Union system. Because that is where the element of confusion arises. But the fact of the matter is that Migingo is in Kenya, we must keep it in Kenya, and we must use diplomacy to convince our neighbors that there is no benefit whatsoever in trying to tamper with Megingo. Thank you very much. Honorable Karua. Megingo is in Kenya, and uh, the joint survey that was conducted between Uganda and Kenya firmly uh, found that Megingo was within our boundaries. What is not clear is why the current executive, of which we have four members here, has not moved to settle the issue. And settling the issue doesn't mean going to war. There are many uh, diplomatic ways of settling the issue through international law, because we must respect the maps and the boundaries. 
So it is a letdown that the current uh, executive has not claimed Migingo. As president, I would not let such a matter stay for such a long time. It and needs to be resolved instant. Thank you. And that is a charge that um, Honorable Odinga should address as Prime Minister. Why have you done nothing about the Megingo issue? Well, uh, Megingo, as the, the others have said, is in Kenya. We did actually discuss with the Uganda government and set up a joint surveying team consisting of experts from Uganda and Kenya. Uh, that survey work has not been completed because of certain technical issues from the other side. Uganda is a friendly neighbor, and it's actually inconceivable that two countries could go to war over a piece of rock on, 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 on the lake. We are trying to resolve this matter peacefully with Uganda, so that because we are now trying to move toward the East African Federation. So we don't want the little issue of Migingo to mar the relationship between Kenya and Uganda. And finally, the final say on the Megingo issue tonight goes to Paul Mute. I think it is unacceptable that we should be forced as a country to be negotiating about Megingo when Uganda, a friendly country, is actually occupied. And they occupied recently. It was used to be occupied by Kenyans. And they are now being given orders by police officers, army officers from Uganda. I certainly would deploy the Navy. You got a fortune it doesn't have a Navy. I'll take it there. Then we negotiate after I've told the Ugandans who occupied wrongfully to go back, then the survey work can continue. And it is not just Megingo. We need also to resolve the issue of LME Triangle. We've got African Union, we've got the United Nations. Let us make our boundaries secure and then have our army to secure. Let's, let's, let, let's make every Kenyan within our boundaries secure. It is unacceptable that people can come from outside, go to Turukana, kill people, not once, twice, or three times. We must respect the life of every Kenyan within our boundaries. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Muita. And indeed, uh, that will be the final comment of part one of this presidential debate coming to you live from the Brookhouse School here in Nairobi. And my colleague uh, is here. Julie will be taking you uh, through part two of the debate. I certainly will. One and a half hours already gone. And another one and a half hours or so to go. Um, uh, we will be coming back with your questions now. Thousands of questions came in. We collected them. We broke them down into thematic areas. And they will be presented to you. Three questions presented to you tonight. And each of you will have an equal chance to address the public on the issues that are raised, what are your commitments to this country, how will you deliver? All that coming up on the way stay with the Kenya Presidential Debates 2013. Thank you. Welcome back to the Kenya presidential debates and time now for part two. This is going to move quite fast. I hope the candidates are all ready. We're taking questions from members of the public who are with us tonight. And we start this session with a question from a gentleman based in Tana Delta area. Let's have Bona Godana. Thank you so much. My Go ahead with your Ismail question. Ismail Godana Dara. Start my, again, please. My name is Ismail Godana Dara. I'm from Tana Delta district. Uh, I'm asking this question in, on behalf of the, my fellow Kenyans. The problem of insecurity of late we have observed a lot of women, a lot of children losing their lives because of insecurity. As, uh, what are your future plans to curb this issue of insecurity in Kenya? Thank you so much to each of the candidates. It's clear that both the domestic issues and external forces as well have contributed greatly to an increase in insecurity in Kenya, along our borders and within the country as well. What does your administration pledge to do for each and every Kenyan, irrespective of locality, social status, age? What is your commitment to this country? I'm going to start in the middle with Peter Kenneth. Thank you, Julie. As your Commander-in-Chief, security will not be negotiable. It has to be absolute. Both internally and externally, if we have any threats. I've said in my plan, I will invest in security. I grew up in this Nairobi, 
When at that time, every police station around all cities had 20 police cars. Two were reserve, 18 were on patrol, and they had to do 200 kilometers a night. Sadly today, with the population 15 times more, police stations have two police cars and have no fuel. I want first to undertake reforms within the police sector so that we can clear the few bad elements that are there and retrain the good elements. I realize that we have a housing shortage of our police officers to the tune of 27,000 houses. We have a shortage of 3,000 vehicles. Yet even the vehicles they have, they cannot undertake any patrols. It is a scandal, Julie, that our police officers can be killed in the manner they were killed in Baragoy by a better equipped catalastras. It is not acceptable. I will be hard on it. I will invest on security. The events in Tana River should never happen in a modern country. And not, just, and not just Tana River. Not just Tana River. We need to equip our police. We need to empower them. At the moment, they are trying to do some job, but they can't do it without equipment. They can't do it without investments. Fantastic. Peter, how will you finance this? First of all, we have invested more in armed forces than our police. Let me tell you, Julie, 10 years ago, our current expenses were 160 billion. Today, our revenue is 800 billion. Our recurrent expenses are 850 billion. We can't survive that way as a country. We need to cut down. We need to reduce our expenses. We need to make our savings from our recurrent Your expenses. Your time is up, but I'm going to give you 10, 20 seconds, actually. Tell us I where, will you, going cut, to where cut. will you cut back? I am going to cut our recurrent expenses with unnecessary expenses in our budget so that Which I can ones direct are unnecessary? traveling, motor vehicle maintenance, and all the retreats and conferences that are taking up. I can assure you, having looked at our recurrent expenses, Julie, we can save between 150 to 180 billion of the current recurrent expenses. Thank you. Let me come to Honorable Musali Mudavadi now with the same question. Yes, first I would like to address uh, Mr. Godana because he raised a very specific issue about Tana River. I was in Tana River area, Delta, uh, uh, early last uh, week. And I want to state that they have a unique problem. Part of the problem is the economic situation and the communities that live there. One will have to have a multifaceted approach to this. You must create an environment where the communities are talking to each other and being able to resolve some of the issues without seeking violence. The other is a resource-based uh, dilemma. We need to work on Tana River and the unique areas like Tana River in this country by making sure we can provide the basic issues, water, and be able to give them some of the very, very critical issues that they need so that they can avoid uh, the conflict that they're going through. There was a commission that was put in place which is supposed to report on the so causes of violence there. Up to this day, that report is not there. Do you it feel much of the crime in this country is, is due to the, the, the struggle over resources? Yes. Uh, the Tana River area is a unique area. It's part, uh, largely a resource-based conflict. Uh, over and above that, then the politicians capt uh, cap uh, capitalize on it to inflame the situation. Ne now, the yes. second aspect of it, because that is Tana River and some of the unique areas like Tana River. But in the long run, mm -hmm. we must invest appropriately in our security agencies. It's not just about uh, having numbers, but they must be better trained, better equipped, and this can be done uh, by prioritizing issues of security, so that when we do allocate resources, we allocate them to the priority areas. You have 20 seconds. Can you give Kenyan specifics when you say better training, better equipped? What are you pledging to the nation? Communication equipment, it has to be there. Um, the mobility of the police must be there. And then the training to be able to detect uh, crime and get sensitivities of these issues before they occur. We must learn to create a situation where they can prevent. And to get the resources, I can tell you if we prioritize our programs and our projects, uh, because there are some projects that we have in our budget, but they will take a long time to consume it. But we can rationalize our resources. Your, t your time is up. And let me come to Martha now on the same issue. Martha, security critical. What would you do? I would invest not just in security, but in the root causes. One of the root causes is poverty and underdevelopment. 
We need good communication in the China Delta, both the roads and other means of communication, and this deters even pursuit of criminals when they strike and the ability to detect. It's generally an area like no other, and it's very, very vast. I would invest in technology. There is technology that can help police uh, to, or security agencies to police such areas without having to have a policeman at every corner. And I dare say that um, also investing in the welfare, that is the salaries, and work environment of the police officers to raise their morale. Also investing in the community by way of um, campaigning so that they become partners with the police. It is not possible to have a secure environment if the citizens are not involved. But I've said about uh, equipping hardware and software, that is technology. Let's talk about that technology. What does it entail? What exactly does is it? I am imagining that uh, they should be able to use satellite, because that's the only way you can um, manage very vast areas. Baragoi would not have happened if we were using satellite. The police would have been able to scan the area before going there. Tana River would be easy to police, and I would make sure that I make sufficient investment to secure not just Tana River, but every citizen, that man, woman, and child, as they go about their daily business, they deserve security. How would you finance our borders. This? How would you finance your security plans, Martha? I would begin with the exact budget that there is for security, cut wasteful spending fast, Make sure that the budget that is there is efficiently used. This is what I did with the water sector reforms. I didn't look for more money first. I first made sure that we efficiently used that money. And within three years, I brought down the cost of boreholes from 6 million to 1.5 million. You're, it is possible. I have to stop you there, but we'll come back to that issue of, of irresponsible or inefficient use of funds in, yeah. in our ministries. Uh, Honorable Ray Laudinka. Internal and internal. First, we must make sure that we have secure borders because we have got insecurity which comes as a result of small arms that come across the border because of the conflict in our borders. Here, our armed forces uh, are equal to the task, and I want to congratulate our armed forces in front, in front of Kenyans tonight for the splendid job that they have done in Somalia in trying to secure our border with Somalia. Internally, we need to continue with the police reforms. We must reform our police so that the policing is efficient. The reforms which have been started need to be continued and completed so that we have a, a police that is more disciplined, better remunerated, better equipped, that can then discharge their responsibilities effectively. Let, let me ask this, uh, Bonapien, before you move on. As, as Prime Minister, what has happened in the Tana Delta, what we've seen in Baragoy, and many other parts of the country have happened under your watch. What's your comment on that? You see, there are certain historical issues that we also need to address, like the issue of the border dispute between the two counties, that is the Tana, Tana Delta and, and, I mean, the Tana County and, uh, and Garissa County. They, all these need to be resolved. But you need to know that uh, pastoralism as a way of life has now become unsustainable in the light of uh, climate change. So we need to find a way of diversifying the economy of our pastoralists so that they can actually be able to exist in this light of this climate change. We still have now the cowboy culture, which was existing in the United States of America in the pre-industrial uh, era. And this is still happening in our society today. Then we need to also improve community policing so that there is trust between the community and the police officers to be able to do proper uh, policing. Finally, there's the issue of poverty. The, the insecurity which comes as a result of poverty can only be dealt with 
by dealing with poverty among our people. I'm going to come back to you because I think uh, it would be great to have you give a comment to uh, Godana who is here today and has suffered at the hands of the insecurity on, on the government response and why perhaps it has failed to, to quell the issue. But let me come to Paul Muite now. Paul, what's your stand on the issues of both domestic and regional security? First, as a Commander-in-Chief, I will take personal charge. And a powerful message will go out that is no longer acceptable, it's not going to be tolerated for communities to take things into their own hands. I will deploy the GSU, if need be, I will deploy the army, because a message has to get across. Whatever disputes you have, let us resolve them as a nation, otherwise than through fighting each other. So you'd be using a tough, you'd be I using a, a tough I think a message hand. needs to get across. Mm -hmm. Because if it doesn't, the communities next door would do it. Because that will give us time to invest in the police, the resources that uh, my colleagues are talking about here, to retrain them, to vet them, and allow those who need to go home to go home. And finally, it will give us time to address the root causes of it, all, which is poverty. You need to come up with economic policies that are going to open up the country and give opportunities to every Kenyan, wherever they are. That is long term. So immediate is a message that this is no longer acceptable. Okay, a stern hand, a, a firm hand. Let me come to uh, Mohammed first and then I'll come through to Professor. <laughs> and uh, Tana River. Uh, our political party, Alliance for Real Change's guiding principle is honest service to humanity. In Kenya, we have the best intelligence. And uh, the intelligence, the Kenyan intelligence can tell you why 12 elephants were killed in 30 minutes. They can tell you, in, in the papers you saw and everybody read, that uh, anybody, uh, the, 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 those who caused a problem and commotion and still causing in Tana River were export, they, they were moved, they were moved to the place. So when uh, security officers cannot do their work because of poor governance, then the only solution is they should be uprooted and you get the, a, a, a clean team. The other thing is, I asked so many Kenyans, why is this problem recurring? And uh, it is only in Kenya where 80% are Christians and 20% others. But you walk for two minutes and you see a board, Mganga, Mganga. Mohammed, so, I'm going to stop uh, you say, there. I'm going to stop say, you there and, and the ask you they, they to address the, the, the question, yeah, which was, what would your they government the problem, do? They, they say the mm -hmm. problem in Tana River will continue because some of the of these leaders are devil worshippers. So and what, instead would, of the what would your government do to resolve the situation? Uh, the, the, only, the only thing is we, we put, implement the constitution. Let every Kenyan uh, 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 actually officer, let every Kenyan employee, anybody employed in Kenya to serve it should be given the mandate to fulfill the obligation. We are very innocent Kenyans. When we hear the, the alarm of an ambulance, we keep aside. Maybe it is, it is, it is not a sick person taken to the hospital, and it is rolls kilos of bunk. Okay. I, st I, I still So what we will do, you, yes. what I will do mm -hmm. is to put the right thing. We will call a spade a spade and not a big spoon. Everything... The judiciary has its function, the executive has its function, uh, the Kenyan constitution is very clear. There's nothing like um, this or this used to happen, no. Uh, we need to put everything in place. Implementation, you're yeah. saying, w will work. Professor, go ahead, please. Julie, what happened in Tana River was totally unacceptable because it went on for almost three months and the government seemed almost unable to contain it. Mm -hmm. If I was president today and there is any problem anywhere in Kenya, I will ask the cabinet secretary in charge or myself to report to that place and stay there until the problem is solved. Before, because beco before you address the long-term issues like unemployment, economic disparities, conflicts over resources, you've got to contain the problem immediately. You've got to save lives. We have got also to involve people Look at uh, the case in Nairobi where the, you, there is a bomb blast. Everybody rushes there. Nobody tells Kenyans that that is already a, a, a cause of insecurity to them and their lives. We've got to involve people and create major awareness. So the ministry in charge of security must be much more 
active than it is now. We must overhaul immigration department because there's too much corruption there. And a lot of illegal people are getting into Kenya and getting out. They're even selling our passports. We've got to stop these things. And corruption is the single most important cause of insecurity in Kenya. If we stop it and become serious, we can stop it. How will you stop it? You, you know, these, a lot of these cartels are entrenched, and if what we've heard from... I think, number one, I will require all the security agencies to be clearly coordinated and a, a, a line of command established with one person who will be able to call the shots, because right now they're going in different directions. Two, we will make sure that we give them the tools and capacity. Three, the people themselves are the first line of defense. Let's engage the people in security matters. Okay, let me come now to Uhuru Kenyatta. And uh, the Jubilee Manifesto goes into quite a bit of detail. It talks about, for instance, 15,000 new recruits a year. Um, uh, tell us more about your plans, uh, and are they too ambitious, perhaps? I think first and foremost, let me address uh, Ismail himself and say that indeed the happenings in Tana River are most unfortunate. And let me say this, in, in my government, a crime will be a crime. No longer will one be able to hide behind their community. If it is murder, you're a murderer. It is not a community. If you are a cattle rustler, you're a cattle rustler. And you will be treated by the law in exactly that manner. As I say that, we need to also recognize that the problem in Tana River also goes a little bit deeper. There are also social aspects that are involved. It is a fight over boundaries. It is a fight over resources. In my government, we will ensure that the pastoral communities in those regions are given adequate access to water for their livestock and adequate also veterinary services for their livestock. We will ensure for our farming communities also in the region that we will expand the irrigation uh, um, programs that were initiated by this government while I was at the Ministry of Finance and my running mate William Muto was in the Ministry of Agriculture. We will seek to expand irrigation in those areas so as to reduce the potential areas of conflict. That said and done, insecurity is not just a problem of Tana River. It's a national problem. We need to be able to address it. I don't think we need to change our pastoral communities per se. I think we can turn our livestock industry into a productive sector. We need to train, to re-educate our pastoral farmers. We need to be able to ensure that we um, give them improved range management, water supply, so that, in short, they don't have to travel all those great distances. We need to commercialize our livestock farming. That said and done, to also reduce incidences of cattle rustling. I think using modern technology, for example, chipping or put, implanting chips uh, in our livestock would go a long way in helping track those animals and track culprits. You're, thank you, your time is up. You've gone into detail on the pastoral, I, I, I think uh, it's pastoralist yeah. issue, mm. but um, we will try and, and go into more on security in just a moment because mm. I'm gonna put another question to each of you. Um, we're speaking of security as we head into an election. And we all know what happened in 2007, 2008. And many questions have come in. This same question actually put in different ways with Kenyans asking, what will each of you pledge to do to ensure that Kenya is peaceful during and after the election? Let me start on this end and go all the way down. Paul, let's start with you. I have already started, there's a party Safina has already started because we have steered clear of whipping up ethnic emotions. We have not mobilized along ethnic lines. And the way we will continue to be issue-based, we will continue to preach the economic policies we are going to implement in order to give everybody a chance. For example, in Taita Taveta, that I don't know which is being mined there. We'll make it a condition that a smelting plant be built there instead of exporting it raw. So, and we will accept the results of free and fair elections. And if you are dissatisfied, now that the judiciary is working, you go to court. We will go to court. We will not ask young people to take up arms. Absolutely. Let's go to Raila Odinga. 
Well, Judy, uh, you know that uh, Kenyans have now had about four uh, multi-party elections. And the, the past, the, 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 the violence was actually before the elections. It was only this last time round in 2007 when we had the violence post-election. And we all know what actually happened. We are all saying that we don't want a repeat of what happened in 2008 to be repeated again in this country. We have said as God that we will accept the results of these the elections. If we are defeated, we will accept defeat. And uh, if there are any complaints, we will go to, uh, go to court. Thank but you. Ten seconds? What we're saying is that uh, we don't want to mobilize along ethnic lines. That's why we are campaigning on a national platform to unite the people. And we also said telling the media to help us do this so that the media also desist from uh, going along the ethnic lines which will actually polarize the country. Like what happened recently, and I mentioned it before, I don't uh, fear to mention it again here. This idea of bundling ethnic figures polarizes the country along ethnic lines. And it is not helpful for a national campaign. Um, um, you want to compete along ideological lines. You have a clear policy that you want to sell to the people of Kenya and to judge us on the basis of the, 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 the program that we're putting before the people. Thank you so much, Martha. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Now Kenya has been spearheading peace for the last five years since the election period. And what we are telling Kenyans is that at the end of the day, after politicians in sight, it is the poor who fight each other. We, the political class, never fight. They have seen us here laughing with each other, greeting each other. So they should not allow us to mislead them with talk of ethnicity. What but will we you must do? show yes. us leadership now. We must be able to abide by the law accept the results of election, and if one is unhappy, you go to court. Even 207, I said anybody aggrieved go, should have gone to court. We've been using the same courts even before the reforms as politicians. So we should never ever tell Kenyans to rise up against each other. We should use the institutions of the judiciary to resolve our disputes. Come to you, Honourable Mudavadi. Um, thank you. Our name, our coalition name, speaks for itself, the Amani Coalition. We have been preaching peace. It may look like a simple thing in the church, but we have been making sure that at every forum, as we discuss issues, the issue of having to work together and conduct ourselves peacefully has been an underlying theme in all our movement. Secondly, we have all signed the Code of Conduct with the IABC. I think we should live up to it so that whatever we are doing, whatever we are asking our supporters to do, whatever our, campaign, uh, our party members are doing, they must live up to the letter of that code of conduct that they signed because it's a requirement in law, it's a legal requirement, we must live up to it. Finally, we must be prepared to accept the results. We all want to win, but there shall be only one winner at the end of the day. So we must be prepared to say that we concede where somebody else has taken the day. And that is the principle that we should carry along in order to be able to foster peace and to be able to make sure that there is tranquility even after the election. Thank you, Peter Kenneth. Thank you, Julie. When I launched my campaign on the 4th of November, I said my campaign will be based on issues. And I've never campaigned without preaching the peace message. Because there will be Kenya after 4th of March. And we must never allow ourselves to go to the events of 2008. Kenya is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. We must never try to destroy it. We nearly brought it down to its knees. Because of the way we behaved in the year 2008, we must never again allow it to go that route. Let me also stress this. Kenya is greater than all of us, and I've said this before. Peter, our, own individual, our own individual interests must never compel the country mm -hmm. to kneel down in anger, in violence. So what will come you the 4th actively of March, do? Mm -hmm. Come the 4th of March, and Kenyan's will is determined through the electoral process. I have no problem conceding if I lose in the unlikely event. But if I win, 
Then I would also wish that all of us observe that Kenya is for all of us and we fit in, we need to coexist, we need to appreciate each other, we need to respect each other. That is the little we can actually ever do for our country. Thank you. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. Our coalition is based on peace, on unity and reconciliation of all communities in this country. If anybody has followed the speeches that I've made in every single rally, I start first and foremost on that note of peace, national reconciliation and unity in order for us to be able to achieve our objectives together as Kenyans. Secondly, the issue of violence often emanates from politicians themselves. I strongly believe that if politicians were to follow due processes, use existing institutions, people would not go to the streets. I have proved this myself in the past, in 2002, where I accepted and conceded defeat to the Honorable Mwai Kibaki. I will not shirk from doing the same again. Kenya is far greater than any single individual, and I do believe that a transparent, democratic process will give Kenyans the leader that they want, and it is for all of us to accept the will of the people and to join hands and support that candidate, who I dearly hope will be me on the 4th of March. <coughs> Professor Ole Kiyapi. We are in this because we love our country. We are in this because we believe every Kenyan matters, and we want Kenyans to win, the Kenyan people to win, irrespective of how each one of us here performs. We are just really so insignificant compared to the millions of citizens, including children, who cannot vote. But we also want to commit that we cannot polarize the country in our own messaging, even in our own campaigns, and we have been very responsible as a party, and we will continue to, to the very end and beyond. But I would like to request the media that when you bring your political analyst, please desist and avoid analyzing how Kenyans are going to vote on the basis of their tribes. Respect the integrity of the citizens that ind individuals can vote for somebody irrespective of which region they come from, but when you start blocking the nation, that is what creates polarization. And let me come to you, Dida, please. Yeah, the code of conduct was a conditional document that we all signed. If we did not sign, we could not proceed with the requirements that were. I request it is a document that has a lot of good things that will promote peace. For those who signed and did not read, let's read it again. And for Kenyans, it is also a document that not the leaders need to go through, it is for everybody. It promotes peace. Number two, we have the national anthem. We need to look at the contents of the national anthem. And uh, in relation to the national anthem, which is a prayer that is recited, we have any piece of art originates from the author. This world, we are just, we are just acting, but it has the, uh, the, 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 the God who manages everything. If we get wrong leaders, it's because we are not sincere. And uh, for Malimu, us, for us, Malimu, those, are words, to... those are words of wisdom. You do have more time, but I want to ask, what will you actively do to ensure that we do have a peaceful nation? I will propagate the code of conduct and its content. And uh, it, it has self, self discipline has to be inculcated. You have to be disciplined. And uh, what this aspect, I don't know why people run away from God. God has designed and he knows who will be the president of this country. God knows the present, the future. If you get it, then it is God who has realized that you are qualified. And if he did not get it, God has seen that you are not qualified, accept the defeat. And I also concur with President Barack Obama that we should not solve our difference in the streets. We need to solve it amicably, following Ac the right procedures. Accepting defeat and going through the legal processes, yeah. not to the streets. Thank you. We have another question from a, a teacher, and her name is Irene. Please go ahead with your question. Good evening. My name is Irene Omangi. I am a high school teacher. My question is on education. I would like the presidential aspirants to let us know that what they will do to ensure that the children who leave primary school transit into high school. Because as we saw last week, 
quite a large number of those children will not get positions in secondary school, and that will mean that they will not get a basic education. What will your governments do to ensure that this problem is clearly solved? Thank you so much for that. I think on the issue of education, if we look back over the past few years in terms of enrollment, we've, we've achieved something as a nation. We have huge challenges when it comes to transition from primary to secondary, but also transition from secondary to higher education. And we're losing hundreds of thousands of students. Um, and where do they go? big issue, probably also becomes a security issue. You know, Professor Kiapi, I am looking at you. This was your docket before you resigned. Julie, the saddest day for me when I was a peer of education was the day when a little boy in Kericho County committed suicide because he didn't make the marks or enough to go to secondary school. But the reason really is that we don't have enough classes in secondary. We have been working to reduce them. Two years ago, 2,250,000 students dropped out of standard aid. This year, 110,000 students will not go to Form 1. What I will do if elected president, next year, I will take 3 billion Kenya shillings and go to 3,000 count district day schools and build a classroom that will take in approximately 150,000 children, and you can mop them in. You can also take another 3 billion, and you'll build a laboratory. It's very, very practical. We put a proposal to Treasury two years ago. We should have done this thing two years ago, but we did, never got the budget. How do you do this and, and maintain education standards, Professor? Because what the way to maintain education standard is just to do two things. Number one, let us hire more teachers. Right now, there's a shortage in the country of 100,000 teachers. And I would like to hire 20,000 teachers every year at a bill of about 7 billion per year. And number two, we must invest in infrastructure, especially in day secondary schools and the so-called county schools. Because right now, there's a big dis disparity between national schools, county schools, and day secondary schools. Some schools have everything, others have no classrooms, enough classrooms, or even laboratories. If we invest in the physical infrastructure and teachers, the quality will begin to go up. Let's thank President Kibaki for bringing kids into the education system in terms thank of you. access. Thank you. Let me come to you, Uhuru Kenyatta, on this issue. Our, manif our manifesto on this is very clear. And I do appreciate the problem that has been mentioned because it is a problem that also contributes to a lot of the social ills that we see. And that's why in our manifesto, we have made it very clear that we want to move to a situation where no child under the age of 18 is out of either school or some training institution. And we have made it clear that we would want to continue adding the classrooms, increasing the number of teachers, as well as ensuring that we have one technical school in at least every ward in our country to ensure that those who do not make it into secondary school at least are able to be given some form of training that they could use to make a livelihood for themselves. So the basic fact is that this would not only help us um, ensure that kids remain in school, but it would also go a long way towards creating or removing the breeding ground that has been there for criminal gangs using these young men and women. You also pledge uh, things like school feeding programs, milk for children in primary school, um, talk about the tablet, the solar power tablet. How will you finance all this? Like I stated severally, and I've done in the past, I do believe there is a lot of waste in government today. We moved when I was Minister of Finance, for example, to ensure that all the fuel guzzlers that were there were removed. These are monies that we could save to put into more uh, serious issues like feeding our children in school, like ensuring no child is out of school before the age of 18. For example, what we are moving towards right now is a Ministry of Foreign Affairs that is better staffed, better equipped with professionals. 
There is no reason for every single conference to be attended by a minister from another department. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, properly staffed, properly equipped, can handle that on behalf of government. There's major savings to be made there from all the unnecessary travel that is made out of this country um, severally. And turn this and put it into more useful uses that benefit the people of this country. Peter, let me come to you on this. And, and you've already heard Professor Ole Kiapi and Uhuru Kenyatta. What, what, what are you going to do that's different and that uh, is better than what they're offering the Kenyan citizens? Well, Julie, first, we must look at quality of our education. It is one thing to give quantity education. is another to guarantee quality education. Because what you're looking from our kids is the outcome. What do they get out of school? That's why I'm saying we must carry out reforms right from ECD going all the way to primary, looking for a reform process that has a continuous education so that you don't just leave a standard eight because you have nowhere to go. The statistics are quite odd. 75% of primary kids make it to secondary school. 32 only make it to campus. So at primary, you drop out 25. At secondary, you drop another 68. So you must invest in education. I do not entirely agree that we have a shortfall in teachers. We actually have poor distribution of teachers. You have areas that have more teachers, whereas you have other areas that have no teachers. How would you distribute, Peter? Where would you, you be have moving to be fair. To... You have to have equality. You have to enforce transfers of teachers to schools that do not have teachers, something that probably my brother professor should have implemented very well when he was there. But much I, I more important 30, than that, you much, much, much more important than that. You still have a minute, Peter. You still have a minute. I'm going to allow you 20 <coughs> seconds because he's been in the ministry and feels he needs to respond to this. The professor. president himself ordered us and we did all the rationalization that could be done. And there is no, no rationalization you can do to breach a gap of 100,000 teachers. It's a shortage which is known, it is known in government, it is known in treasury, and there is nothing my brother can do to bridge that. You must just hire and from, teachers. And from the words of a teacher? The former permanent secretary, as, as I quote him, I look for seven billion to pay teachers. Uh, how do you want to pay, as proposed by the Salaries Commission, 14.73 billion to 3,650 3, officers, and you pay 7 billion to 500,000 teachers. Is that fair? A, a very important question raised, and I think we'll come back to that with each and every person to speak about salaries and allowances and what we've been seeing, the trends we've been seeing in government. So Peter, uh, Professor says we, we have a huge shortfall of 100,000. He has not addressed the issue of distribution of teachers. I am making it absolutely clear that there are some areas in our country that have more teachers, whilst there are some areas that are lacking teachers. The distribution has never been effected efficiently. But what I'm saying in our reform plan, we must invest from ECD, continuation from 38. We have proposed a national polytechnic for each county because we would like to see fourth formers who leave go into polytechnics because we converted our polytechnics into university colleges and forgot that there is a high rate of dropouts. Two, we must agree to invest in our education system. In the last five years, the government has borrowed more than had been borrowed in the last 26 years in terms of total aggregate. Our debt was 700 billion in 2007, it's now 1.8 trillion. We have not invested in real education using the money that we have borrowed. Let me come to you, uh, Musali, and you can see the debate happening here. Is there, in your opinion, a shortfall in the number of teachers? Is it about redistribution? And also the issue has been raised of the huge gap in, in pay, and how can you morally support uh, what's been going on within our, our, our government? Well, I, <clears throat> I must say that uh, one of the things that uh, is now a constitutional issue is the fact that basic education is up to the fourth form level. And really, if we have to implement the constitution and live up to it, we must start as a nation preparing ourselves to provide support so that our young children can get to fourth form level uh, through the public support. That is a must. We must do that. That, that is a commitment your government that is making. That is a commitment my government is making. To take them right through till four. Now, four. one of the things that we, we, we must look at is that the whole idea of financing our social sector, and education is one of the pillars under our social sector, 
we must remember that it is comprehensive, it is holistic. We must manage the economy well in order to be able to provide the resources that are going to go here. For instance, there are issues that are pending about privatization in this country. We can raise a lot of resources by carrying through the whole process of privatization in this country and be able to assign those resources to areas like education. Which institutions are you talking about? For instance, we could still privatize the, the, the port of Mombasa. It can be done. We can still look at even the privatization of the airport's authority. All these are issues that can be done. They can be managed uh, efficiently. They can be turned around and they can generate a lot of revenue that can go into uh, the, the, the institutions like the health and education. And to me, these are the areas that I would focus on in order to start raising resources that I can divert to be able to cater for the education of our children. Let's be a bit more specific with education and when you say investment, and there's only a few seconds left, mm -hmm. but give us some specifics of what pledges you are making to this nation on education. At this education. point in time, I'm saying that the Amani government is going to provide free and compulsory education to up to form fourth form. form level. That allows us to have our children in school longer. Otherwise, if we continue to guillotine them at standard eight, we are putting them, condemning them to child labor, which is again another breach of the law. So okay. we must keep them there longer, and after that, be able to invest in our polytechnics to allow them to gain some skills for those who do not get to the university. Martha, over I'll to you. I'll begin by that. saying that if it were not for education, I would not be here today seeking the trust of Kenyans. I value education and I am glad that my colleague has now joined what NAC Kenya has been pledging. Free primary and secondary education, and primary starts with early childhood, and um, accessible university education by providing loans in public universities for the three basics, that is tuition, accommodation, and meals, so as to equalize the children of the poor to get the same education as the children of the rich. I also believe that infrastructure in our schools must be built by the government. If we say compulsory education and we don't take over infrastructure, then the situation that has been there with the free primary education, with kids studying outside, will continue. And I have a practical example of turning every prim public primary school into a day secondary school. In my constituency, using CDF, we were able to increase the number of secondary schools from 16 to 37. Out of the 42 public primary schools, almost every primary school is a secondary. That way you are able to bring in more students. I can't say we have attained the level we would like, but with compulsory pre-primary, uh, including early childhood and secondary education, you will retain as many. I want to acknowledge that we would have to hire more teachers. And, and, and where do the funds come from? Where do we get funds? I will not talk of privatization because that's a one-off. It's not sustainable. I am saying start with the same money you have. Increase efficiency. Treasury's own admission is that we lose one third of our budget through um, looting or theft of public funds and misuse. So if we start looking at where we, we are misapplying money, and then widen the tax base because there's still a lot of people Thank who are you, not Martha. paying taxes. Thank you, Martha. Then we would be able to do that. Honorable Raila yeah. Odinga, your government um, uh, over the past uh, five years, and certainly this did start in 2002, has achieved a lot since we first introduced free primary education and have moved on now to, to do more. So in terms of having more children in school, it's a success, but in terms of quality, there are huge issues. And of course, again, we talked about the transition issues as well. What would you do in this coming administration to change things? First, you know, we are talking about an inclusive government, Kenya for all, and we must start here by offering equal opportunity for each and every child born in our country. We are talking about manpower development, and this starts here at the nursery and at the primary. The first thing we are saying is uh, free education must be really free. Free must be truly free, meaning that there will be no thing like uh, uniforms, 
be, to be provided by parents, things like uh, writing materials, uh, textbooks, and so on. All that will be provided for by the government. And then uh, we want to ensure that there's a higher rate of transition. In 2007, the transition rate was 66%. It has moved gradually to 73% in 2011. Uh, this time around, it was 78%. It's still unacceptable. We want to see a higher rate of transition from primary to, to secondary. But it's also disparity between girl, child, and, and, and boys. More boys transit than girls. So we want to address the issue of girl child education in this country. For example, this issue of sanitary towels, which I talked about last time round. I've tried to push it this time in this government, but there's been a lot of resistance. We are going to ensure that there's sanitary towels in each and every primary school in our country, provided for by the government, to ensure that girls actually have equal opportunity to move, transit like boys. We're talking about sanitary towels, but a, a provision was made to actually start to give sanitary towels to schools by government, but I also want to introduce the whole issue that has been raised by Dida of, of, of the pay and the huge discrepancies between the, the pay of teachers and, for instance, uh, members of parliament. Yes, there's a shortage, and I've actually myself mediated in these negotiations. You know, there's a shortage of teachers, and I agree with Professor Kiyapi, we must hire more teachers. We must hire more teachers so that we reduce the, the ratio, the teacher-children ratio in primary schools. How do you deal with the issues then of pay? Paying and of course, of, of, of paying uh, of you know, the additional number of teachers. This people. is an issue we have looked at very carefully. First. By admission of treasury alone, they say about 30 billion shillings is actually wasted in government. And what I've said, we are going to transform the public sector within the first 100 days to ensure that we have that saving. We'll have then also, in terms of revenue, every year the revenue increases by 100 billion shillings. So we will divert about one third of that revenue to primary and secondary education to ensure that our children get quality education right through to secondary. Thank you. Let me allow Martha to come in here. My problem is that just looking at the campaign of court of my learned colleague and the lavish spending of that campaign and most of the campaigns of my colleagues here, except a few, I am just wondering if they continue with that lavish spending. Where will the money come from? When I say that we will ensure that theft of public funds and abuse is uh, curbed, I have practiced it in my campaign. So how is uh, the, my honorable colleague Raila going to do that? Honorable Raila, I'll allow you to respond Campaign to that. time is campaign seconds. time. And that's why <laughs> people actually do fundraising. Look at the amount of money they used in the U.S. campaign recently, the Romney and the Obama campaign. You raise money from friends because you have to reach the rest of the country. So, but this is very different once we finish campaign and we sit down to serious business of governance. Perhaps the question is, in a country of great need, can yeah. we afford these lavish campaigns? Peter Kenneth, please. Prime Minister, he's just admitted here that government has owned up to losing 30 billion shillings per year, which I actually think is much higher than that. What is it did he do as a principal to ensure we do not lose that for 30 years? And what is it he would do differently so that we can have these funds going to certain critical areas of social economy in our country? I was coming actually to Paul Mwite's education promise with that question, but I will allow the Prime Minister 30 seconds to respond to that and then come to Paul Mwite with that issue and also the education issue. But first, Honorable Raila, you've been asked a question by Peter Kenneth, 30, 30 billion you say? And what have you My done about it? friend actually he knows he's been an assistant minister. He was in the Treasury, then he was now in planning this last time around. And he knows the challenges that come with running a, a coalition government, particularly a ground coalition government. I have been charged with the responsibility of supervising and coordinating. But there are certain other areas where there's impunity and there's very little that as a principle you can do. Uh, and that is known. The, minister, the former Minister of Finance, Honorable Uru Kenyatta, has just admitted that is this kind of wastage in the finance ministry. 
but it does not tell and us uh, what it did. Let me come straight to Uhuru. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you have admitted there is wastage as well, and what have you been doing about uh, thank it? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't run away from the problem. The truth is that, indeed, there is a lot of wastage in government. And like I said, my record on that is very clear. I tried various uh, endeavors to curb that excessive spending especially with regard to the vehicles that I mentioned, trying to reduce on trips. And let's put it on record, the trips that we're even trying to, to reduce, the biggest spender on foreign trips in the government of Kenya, this coalition government, is the office of the Honorable Prime Minister. I'm going, to come, back, I'm going to come back to the Prime Minister uh, before the most I do. Important, the most important aspect <laughs> is that it was under my tenure that we introduced the integrated financial management systems, all aimed at ensuring we have better management and better financial accountability of our resources. Okay, so that's something practical that I can say I've done moving in towards the direction of ensuring that we curb wastefulness in government. Let me come back to you, Honorable Railo. Yes. The accusation is that your office, in fact, is, is a big spender. The reason why whenever the Prime Minister goes out of the country, like even the President, he goes with a bigger entourage because he goes with several other ministers and he always goes out there to try to negotiate funding for the country. So what my office has brought back into this country is far much larger than the little amount that was spent in taking delegations out of this so country. So indeed you're saying you do spend more. I see your hand, Martha. I'm going to come first to, to Dida and then to yourself, Martha. You know, one shocking thing, the lady asked about children who completed their eight and how they can move ahead. Mm -hmm. You can talk about children when you have them. You can talk about children when you have them, that's one. Two, 90% of children in, in, in primary schools attend the public primary schools. How many of them have their children in the public schools, primary schools? Let me ask, and let me ask that thing, question, and I'm, I'm doubting that hands will go up. But uh, how many of you have children in school, public. first of all? Have how many of you have children in, in, in prim primary or secondary school? Mine have finished. My daughter is in secondary. How many? How, okay, thank you. Thank you. So you're not so old. How many of you have them in, in public secondary schools? One hand, Professor Olekiapi and Mali oh, The football well. team are there. Yes. I, I, I'll come back to you in just a moment for your plans for education. Martha, very quickly, and then I'm going to... I just wanted to tell my colleagues, and especially the Prime Minister, Honorable Raila, it is possible to negotiate for the country the loans you do, which thank you very much. But be efficient. Carry a lean, mean delegation. Let's not waste funds. A quick 10-second response, please. I always do that. Uh, all my, the members of my delegation are people who add value to the trips. I don't just take people on a joyride. They all come because they have something to contribute during the trips. Thank you. Peter, 10 seconds. Yes, I think, Julie, we are going around this question. Mm -hmm. When I left Treasury in 2008, January, the total borrowing was 700 billion. Right now, the borrowing is 1.8 trillion. Kenyans have to pay. Our kids will pay. Our grandchildren will pay. The fact remains we have not invested within the sectors that we ought to invest in to help the population at large. And with that, it brings me back to education. I come to Honorable Paul Mwite, your commitments to this country on the issue of education, particularly ensuring that children stay in school and they have a quality education. First, to raise the quality of education in public schools because Safina is very concerned with the difference in terms of the quality of education between the public schools and private schools. And as a few people here have said, most people who can afford it, even those who cannot afford it, sacrifice to send their children to private schools. We need to invest more and upgrade, uplift the quality of education in our public schools. Yes, we have free primary education. What is the quality? We need to invest more. We need to invest more, not just in primary school, in terms of quality ratio of students to the teachers, equipment in uh, public schools, computers, and what have you, in public schools. We need to raise it so that even ministers of education and PSCs in Ministry of Education can take their children to these public schools. Where is the money going to come mm -hmm. from? The elephant in the room, Julie, is corruption. Yeah, yeah. 
the peers in the Ministry of Finance admitted that upwards of 40% of budget every year somehow disappears. If we were to close corruption, we would have adequate money to invest in education and the other deserving uh, uh, sectors. We need to carry out a forensic audit, parliament ordered forensic audit. Let me ask, let me ask you this, Paul, because uh, uh, practically everybody here, most people here have been in government in one way or another, have served. And, uh, and yet haven't. everybody accepts, everybody accepts that, uh, or, or have served as a member in the House, everybody accepts that corruption is a massive issue. Yes. So who are these crocodiles and hyenas who are stealing the money I of the Kenyan public? Where are they? Why can we not find them? Julie, if we need to deal with corruption in this country. We have to have the courage to confront the past. Why is Crow report that lists all the billions stolen from here and stashed overseas? Why has it not been implemented? Why have we continued to pay ghost for ghost projects? For example, we are still paying for loans we borrowed to come and build railway lines. We are repaying the loans. And everybody knows the only railway line we have is the one constructed in 1900 by the British. Thank you, Paul. I, I come now to uh, Malimu Mohammed uh, for your thoughts on what yeah. your government would pledge to do for this nation in terms of education. To improve the quality of education, one thing is very, very important. The current system of education promotes is exam-oriented. And it encourages just rote learning. So the best thing that can improve education in our schools and in Kenya is to encourage a system that will, will actually motivate or come up with more thinking. Today you can see somebody with a PhD in electricity and if there's a problem with the electricity system in the house, he will spend in the darkness. And then somebody who was a standard eight dropout and formally got the system and will come and do it the following day. It, will not, it is not helpful. Maybe God knows that God, uh, 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 parents, 100 and, uh, 119,000 standard eight leavers were locked out of the secondary school. Maybe they will have fought, wasted another four years. And it is better they start selling bananas in the street to, to earn a living. It, it's painful, it's, so it's, the other it's, thing, but, but, the but other what's thing is, the way forward? The other thing is we restore the value and dignity of teachers. Mm -hmm. A teacher is just like a lactating a cow. For you to get the best out of it, for you to get the maximum product, you need to consider so many factors. What when factors? the entertainment allowance of, of, of these so-called leaders, the entertainment allowance is half a million, you ask a teacher about his life. The teacher is there physically because a tough a head principal or a head teacher is there marking the attendance. But if he had any option, he would have cheated to go and get something else that will give him more plus, plus the 20,000 that he or she is getting. So the teachers are frustrating. Parent-teacher relationship. 20, 30 years ago, a teacher was a very respectable person in the society, but today, every child has a lawyer. You do the, the child will do the wrong thing and you want to, con co you want, it is a moral obligation to correct the student, but uh, you are summoned. Okay. And lawyers are very, very funny characters I, in this I, country. I, they don't I, care. I, <laughs> It's interesting, but I'd still love to know more about what you would actually do. Your time is up, however, and, and we're moving on from this issue to the next issue. And I think the fact that we've been talking about the inefficiencies and the corruption and the money that is being lost in the government yeah. through that, and everybody here admits clearly that it is happening, we come to the issue of health, where corruption means life and or death. death. Yeah. We know that communicable diseases have been a huge problem for this country. Now we see non-communicable diseases like cancer claiming so many lives. And uh, we have a question from a lady tonight, Alice, who works in the health sector. Please go ahead. Hello. How Please are hold you? your mic up. Yes. Hello. I'm glad to see you. So my name is Alice Shundu from Health Sector, and I'll not be complete without talking about uh, a patient, health service provider, and the community who are partakers of the services. So my first question will be on the services. 
So what do we intend to improve? Because we have high mortality, high maternal mortality in Kenya. How do you intend to improve that if you are elected as a president? On healthcare providers, we have seen doctors, nurses, clinic officers on the street striking for remunerations, for motivations, and good working conditions. What, what do you intend to do on that? Because it's like it's compromising the healthcare services. Then the last one will be on the community who are the partakers of the services. We have poor Kenyans who have got chronic illnesses like cancer, like renal diseases, and they need a lot of money for the care. They end up dying because Kenyatta is overstretched and the other private hospitals are very expensive for them. What are you going to do in that area? Thank you very Thank you. much. And uh, Alice has asked three questions. <laughs> and I'll try to, to summarize them. She talks about high maternal mortality rates in Kenya. I think we all must be aware that this is a huge issue and it shouldn't be happening. How will you address this? She talks about health sector workers striking constantly. And we saw the toll this took on our country last year. And also chronic diseases. Let's try and capture this in, in, in one question about the health sector. There's the issue of access, perhaps, to health care. And there's the issue of access to quality health care and, of course, better pay conditions for those in the, in, in the sector. Um, let me start uh, this time with the lady. Martha Karua, please go ahead. Uh, Martha Karua government will give free health services to all Kenyans, universal access. And um, it means that we will be able then to cut down on the maternal and child mortality. We'll also be able to look after the cancer patients after everybody. And I'm aware that it will be capital intensive at the beginning. But as we move on, we will be emphasizing more on promotive and preventive health care. And we will also move to equip, to build infrastructure, because there are areas where the dispensaries and the health facilities are very far from the people. Starting with the county level, making sure that all the diagnostic equipment are available in every county. There is no reason why people should be trooping to Kenyatta for cancer treatment. The machine costs 100, uh, just under 200 million. It wouldn't take much to equip 47 counties with those machines and other diagnostic machines. When you see the striking health workers, the nurses, the doctors, it's not just about their pay. It's also about the equipment, the facilities they are working in. Facilities that have not been refurbished, equipment that is lacking in hospitals. I have traversed this country during my campaigns and have seen the sorry state of district hospitals in Lodua, let me, ask, Lamu, let me ask everywhere. you this, Martha. Yeah. You say it wouldn't take much. Where has the failure been? Why have we performed so dismally when it, it comes to It is just a care? question of priorities. I look at a country like Cuba. Cuba is not one of the rich countries. They have universal access to health and free education up to university. It's about priorities and the way you spend the money. And until we fight the two um, vices, corruption and impunity, that is theft of public funds and wastage, and we make people account then we shall forever be saying we cannot afford essential services. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Raila Odinka, uh, it's about priorities. Has the government had misplaced priorities and what would you do differently? Julie, uh, under chapter four, that is the human rights uh, chapter, Medicare is actually a fundamental human right. It says that every Kenyan, when sick, as should have access to Medicare. So we are going to, as we said, to implement constitution. That's why we are a coalition on, for reforms and uh, uh, democracy. Now, Medicare is a fundamental right of our people. And we are going to do this, first by introducing a comprehensive, comprehensive national health insurance scheme. This has been an issue which has exercised the minds of Kenyans for a long time. It has been debated for a long time. You remember, the bill was brought to parliament, it was approved, 
-hmm. under the former Minister for Health, but then it did not get the assent of the, the President because of the, the lobbying um, that has stopped it. But Kenyans are actually more concerned with services. Kenyans would be willing to pay a little more for quality services. So what we are talking about here is we are going to deal with issue of access, accessibility and affordability. So we are talking here in terms of facilities being brought closer to the people, from the sublocations to locations to the constituency to the county and then the national level so that we can actually reduce pressures on the other national institutions. Let me ask this. As, as Prime Minister for the past few years, why has this not already started to happen? Because there have been a resistance uh, from, from other uh, the, the big boys, as you know. And who are the big a, boys? A, a lot of who are, lobbying. Who are the, who are the, the big boys? The, 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 the big boys are known, the big insurance companies. Who have resisted private it sector, you are saying, and there are some private sector players yes, seated in here today. They're, they're, they're here, and you're saying that they will also have their own fair share in this market. This market is, is big enough for those, they're those who can afford to pay. But we are saying that it's not right that the few who have the money who can afford to pay can get quality services at the expense of the majority who cannot afford to pay. So he's saying that uh, one, we say that antenatal. Uh, services will should be will be free completely. Thank you. You want issues like HIV AIDS that people have access to medicine for free. Thank and you. Your, your your time is up. I have to stop you there. Uh, Honourable Paul Mwite, uh, private sector is stopping government from being able to give the citizens of this country the health care they deserve. Do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? Well, Julie, I didn't know until tonight. That there are boys bigger than the Prime Minister and the President of the Republic of... In this country, indeed. But, but, Julie, a Safina government would invest more in preventive health care, not just curative health care. It's all an issue of money. But this is not academic because the truth is that many Kenyans across our country are dying before their time because of diseases that can be cured because they cannot afford the drugs. They cannot afford to go to the hospital. So that constitutional right of access to affordable health care, the Safina government would actualize it. But there are some simple issues that can be implemented that do not cost a lot of money. Go to Nigeria, go to South Africa. They've got this specially designed motorcycle, which is actually almost an ambulance. And instead of waiting for those people in the reserve to travel across distances where there are no roads, the doctors drive, ride a motorbike to where they are. They're able to assist women in the countryside, to deliver in their homes, in clean, hygienic conditions. I would implement such measures. This is a local solution, you feel, for, for the local situation? Yeah, yeah. It situation. works very well in Nigeria. It works very well in South Africa. They climb all the mountains. That's what they, we should do it immediately while we are working out for longer-term solutions. But I must also say that anybody who has observed Kenya will know that the Ministry of Education, not just during the current government, but traditionally, has been a den of corruption. Mm -hmm. And you leave it at that. That needs to Hang be cleaned me. up. And if you want to deal with corruption, you must address past corruption so as to send the message impunity will no longer be tolerated. Thank you. And I come to this side, Dida, please go ahead. I see Peter Kenneth's hand we up. Can, no. We can no. talk about... Prof Pro Professor, in a moment, sorry. Go we ahead. can talk about so many referral hospitals. Mm -hmm. In fact, one in each county. We can also talk about training so many personnel, medical, but the whole thing is how, to what degree, the magnitude of sincerity. In fact, Kenyans were very happy when the new constitution was in place. But the first step was to give 3,000 plus state officers 14 billion. And uh, the president is not there. The ministers are not there. The cabinet is not there. Nurses are in the street. We have a problem. We are hungry. You don't look at them. You start preparing the stage for 
for people who are not characters who are not there. You're what I will do, yes. what I will do, <laughs> that is cost effective. Yes. Uh, my government will come up with what we call preventive medicine. A simple policy that every Kenyan should test, and this is in philosophy and religious studies. If you want to be healthy, eat when you're hungry. Mm. This timetable, I don't know who brought it, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then the dinner you come up with, phase one where you take soup and mushroom, and then phase two, phase three. That what, is, what will that you is do? What if you want you to be saved will, from yes. corrupt leaders, mm -hmm. if you want to be saved from, from corrupt leaders, you adapt preventive medicine. Principle number one, eat when you feel the pangs of hunger. Number two, when you feel the pangs of hunger, don't fill your belly with food. You eat every gatheri and then there is no space for water. You need to give a third water, a third food, and then a third breathing space. You're so saying what practical, my government you're will saying encourage, practical living. You're saying what my government will yes. encourage is preventive medicine. Mm -hmm. You will not even be forced to go and, and stand before oh, corrupt. You know, this is a century. Imagine, after so many years of, of leadership, we are treating jiggers and we are washed, planning to wash hands. It and then we still say, we want to do this and this. Where are you? And who is the government? Thank you. It, it is a shame that we are dealing with jiggers in this great country of ours at this point Julie, in time. Professor, and, and particularly because you've been in that yes. ministry, you've talked about corruption in the ministry. You've talked about cartels. And we've all accepted here the cost of corruption in this country. What would you then do? First of all, we have a very serious problem. And the biggest challenge is that the health budget right now is only 6% of the national budget against the Abuja declaration of 15%. 15. So, so we are not even halfway. Number two, right now we have 2,500 doctors in public hospital against 7,500. 23,000 nurses against the WHO requirement of 60,000. So if you want to improve maternal, uh, I mean, the, the, the health outcomes and reduce this maternal mortality and infant mortality, ma, ma, you know, you got to increase the number of workers and improve remuneration. And I agree with him that we must adjust salaries from the top all the way down until they are right. But having said that, I will do three things to improve the health sector. Number one, is to get doc doctors to go down to primary health facilities. Because that's really the first line of attack. Right now, all our doctors are waiting at the tertiary or second level. So a lot of people, by the time they reach there, already complicated cases. Number two, we go into the issue of prevention, which must be linked to environment and what he's talking about, food quality, and that is community awareness. And number three, must involve management, because there's a lot of waste in the system, not only in terms of corruption, but also even managing the resources that we are sending in. I'm going to and, stop and you. And finally, uh, yes. we must stop high dependency on donors for HIV AIDS. Right now, 95% of the treatment for HIV AIDS is from donors. It's from donors. Uh, please go ahead, Dita, your hand was Yeah, there's a student from Lenana School, after going to the university, he had his degree in pharmacy and was posted to Gariza District Hospital as a pharmacist. But he received, you know, he called me and was asking me, I was asked to sign uh, that I have received certain number of cartons of, of medicine. And he, in the real sense, what was presented to him were five. Then he was asking me uh, when he insisted that he won't, this was... The, 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 MO, the medical of provisional at that time told him, please, if you want to save your job, just sign. sign. And this is the corruption because it is in provision where, where do you take, of you medical... You train these staffs, where do you take them? Let me come to you, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, on this very serious issue. Lives are being lost. It is a painful thing, especially in a country where we're seeing cancer, diabetes, asthma now on the rise. And, and even now, I think the cancer now as a killer has overtaken tuberculosis and HIV AIDS combined. What would your government do? I think first and foremost is the recognition that uh, we need to ensure we have a healthy nation. And indeed, we are seeing a, a huge increase in um, especially um, cancer and uh, tuberculosis and other um, lesser but preventable, preventable uh, diseases uh, rising. That said and done, I think our manifesto is very clear. We have indicated that we want to move 
in the shortest possible time to a regime of universal health care. But we're not saying that we're going to wait until then. We're saying that immediately we want to be able to ensure that all our um, health centers, our dispensaries, are free to our citizens. Furthermore, we have gone no ahead. No cost at all. We have gone ahead and said that when it comes to uh, maternal health care, and in order to reduce both um, child and maternal mortality, we are saying that no woman will be charged at a public institution for having to have um, her delivery. With this, to me, is the beginning. And again, it, it, it may sound ambitious, but this is something that we have actually practically tried when we had the um, um, economic stimulus program, for example. And we managed to build a health center in every constituency in the country with a wing dedicated for maternal health care. This is a program that we want to continue and will continue. Uhuru, with entrenched cartels, this is the reality we're dealing with. How do you deal with that? How do you, you have to ensure that at the public level you have the right facilities with the proper equipment, people will go to the facilities. We need to equip our facilities. We need to ensure that every area, a Kenyan can have access to a public health institution where he can receive treatment, which will then reduce also. And again, it'll be working in tandem. We're not saying that private institutions will not be there. But it is the primary responsibility of government to provide or make available health care for its citizens. And that is what I'm saying. We need to have those institutions better equipped, better staffed, and also with the necessary drugs so that people can have access, especially to those issues that are preventable. Thank you. Uh, Peter, let, let's just address it also from the point of view uh, that we assume resistance to change. Your administration comes in, they're entrenched cartels, what do you do? I think first there were three questions that the lady asked mm -hmm. and one was on mortality rates. Maternal mortality. And I think as a country we've done much better than we could have done or we had done before under the MDGs because we supplied lots of nets as a, as a country to young mothers and helped. But as a professor said, we have not invested enough in the health sector. We are still investing at 6% instead of 15%. So that is one. Two, she also spoke about doctors, nurses, and clinical officers. It really pains me that they hold on their strikes. We don't treat them with urgency. And yet when other sectors like teaching profession go on strike, we deal and come up with deals that take them back to class. So we've not treated the medics in a very professional manner. Three, we do need a healthy population if we are going to grow our economy. We need strong people who are going to work for this economy. We are now dealing with lifestyle diseases. Diabetes is the biggest killer today in our country. Our women are dying of breast cancer, cervical cancer. Our men are dying of prostate cancers. Things that we can be able to deal with and diminish from our society if we invest in our medical healthcare system. My plan has been very clear. I want to put up another 45 referral hospitals in the 45 counties that do not have, so that we can decentralize into counties, so that they can take care of level four, level five health centers and dispensaries. Julie, I grew up in a system that was working. It has worked before. I went to a city council dispensary. It worked. I went to a city council health center, it worked. And then the, the cartels problem, came. <laughs> the problem that arose is that we stopped investing in the health sector. Mm -hmm. It became of a stretch. The, po the population grew, but we did not invest. Okay, I'm going to come to Honorable Musali Amudal, <coughs> your responses to the issues at hand. Uh, yeah, yes, there are quite a number of issues. One, um, the constitutional provision clearly say that the mandate of the county governments will be to deal with some aspects of health. And our colleagues have spoken here, but they have not realized that. So some of the things they are promising in the context of the national government, when you look at the constitutional provision, are now going to be the domain of the county governments. So we need to be very careful and make sure that we are placing responsibility where it lies. So one of the things that needs to be done, especially for the basic health care, we must then work very closely with the county governments that are going to be in place 
because the responsibility of providing health will be there. Now, the other aspect that needs to come out very clearly is that issues of maternity health, uh, maternal, uh, uh, mortality. maternal mortality rate, we need to invest in a few other things. I was in Kizingitini, right at the far flung end of, of uh, Pate Island in Lamo County, and I met a nurse, and she told me, we don't have water here. Water is shipped by the DAOs so that they can get it in the hospital. Now, if you cannot provide basics like water, then how are you going to tackle this issue of mortality rate at that level? Because clean water is necessary for deliveries and so forth. Now, all these are issues that I think we can focus on and then provide and train and support uh, those people who, who provide these services the midwives, the ones who have played a major role, even in the villages, and we have tended to disregard them. We need to find a way of recognizing them and supporting them. I would also want to go further and say that when it comes to the issue of health, yes, we are all committing in our, in our manifestos that we shall provide universal uh, health care and so forth. But this is a good intent, which can be achieved, but we cannot achieve it if we shun the private sector. We have to work with the private sector to be able to do this. And in the medium term, uh, the reality is that we have to also appreciate that we shall develop these better facilities if we work with our development partners. I know we should not rely on them entirely, but the health sector is such that you cannot just abandon a process that it has to be built up. And I want Thank us to you. be pragmatic when we're moving ahead. Thank you. Um, I think the, the, the one question that still remains outstanding and perhaps could be answered in the next debate is, who are these shadowy figures in government who eat up all the funds that could go into areas like security, education, and health? Martha, 10 seconds. Dida, 10 seconds as well, and okay, then we make just final to comments. Remind my colleague, Honorable Mudabadi, that policy belongs to the national government. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the policy, our, my policy or our policy on universal health care, I take responsibility at the national government level, implementation, those are details about how to implement countrywide. Thank you. Yeah. Peter, please. I think, uh, who eats this? That was answered by Martin Shkuku before he died. He said, in the Kanu regime, people used to eat up but it used to, the spills, the spillings Would trickle. was felt yeah, down. But in this regime, they are eating more than they used to eat in canoe, but nothing. Nothing, nothing comes, trickles yeah, down. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to wind up in yes. the opposite end. Uh, on, on the, on, on the, our time is literally up, and, and we want you to make your closing statements oh, no. and to have the comfort. I'm going to allow how many people want to chip in for 10 seconds? Right, uh, Well, um, uh, what has happened is that you have got a national government and the county government, but these two must work in a complementary manner. The national government is responsible for policy and also supervision of the county government to ensure that the standard is uniform. Secondly, we must also work with the private sector. What we are talking about is not with the exclusion of the private sector. This thing, agenda, is so important. And you know, for example, how contentious it has been. In the United States, the Obamacare, it's a very contentious issue. We think it is actually doable here, and it's what is going to actually make Medicare accessible and affordable to every Kenyan. I, I think, you know, we all remember uh, Honorable Charity Ngilu trying to introduce um, the health insurance package and, and, and the huge lobbying around that. Um, but uh, we've come to the end, so we don't have time to go into uh, that you know, in, in detail. I want to ask each of you to just reinvigorate yourselves for this final word that you will give to the country. And uh, I start on this end, on the opposite end now, with uh, Honorable Paul Mute. Uh, please go ahead. Close to 50 years after independence, Kenya is still part of the third world, poverty-stricken, disease, and what have you. As a FINDA government, the objective will be to uplift Kenya from being part of the third world into being a second or first world. It can be done if we come up with the correct economic and social policies 
targeting the majority. In order to do that, we believe that Kenya needs a chief executive who has not been part of the executive. The executive is the president, the prime minister, the deputy prime minister, the ministers, the assistant ministers, PSs. You need an outsider with the courage and decisiveness. If that is so, Mr. Muita fits the bill. <laughs> Please, Ro Raila Odinga, go ahead. Well, uh, Kenya is now 50 years down the road. These 50 years, there have been two forces pulling in two di op op directly opposed directions. The forces for retention of status quo versus the forces for reform and change. And this is where we are, where, where we are here. What you are trying to say is that the, retention, the forces for retention of status quo are responsible for what we have today. Our per capita income was higher than that of Korea in 1970. 110 against 79. Today, Korea's per capita income is $22,000 against $460 here in Kenya. The reason, because of the mediocrity with which this country has been led for the last 50 years. The time for change is now, and that change will come through the Coalition for Reforms and Democracy, which has got a comprehensive agenda to move Kenya from a third world status to a first world status. Thank you. Martha. The major problem we have in Kenya is theft of public funds and abuse of office. The way each one of us is conducting their campaign, running their political party because we are all in the leadership of our political parties, is an example of how we run government. Kenya is in our hands collectively. It's up to you as a voter to decide whether you want a government full of wastage full of corruption like we have seen exhibited in the party elections. If you want a person you can trust to keep her word that I will fight corruption from the front, I will stop theft of public funds and I'll make sure that the interests of each Kenyan comes first. Then use your vote wisely. I believe in you, the next person, and all of us together in one accord, all moving forward to save Kenya from the vices that are currently going on. Thank you very much, Honorable Musali Mudavari. Yeah, this is not a time to gamble. I mean, we have been talking a lot, but we cannot gamble. There must be a clear position here that are we voting for stability? Are we voting for security? Are we voting for predictability in how we are going to manage the state of affairs in this country? I can tell you that if you're going to create jobs and you want to invite investment and you want to deal with the high unemployment levels, then clearly you must show that you are ready to provide security and stability in this, in this country. You must be able to provide clear management and clear policies that will make sure that the Kenyan investor will feel comfortable to put their money on the table and generate jobs for Kenyan people. This, I can tell you, is what we offer in Namani coalition. We offer that predictability, that security. We are the safe pair of hands for the Kenyan people. And I can tell you, if Kenya wants to move ahead very rapidly, after the Kibaki uh, retirement, Thank they you. should vote for Musalia Mudavadi and the Amani coalition. Thank you. Peter Kenneth. Julie, let me start by thanking the organizers for making this happen so that we can all be evaluated. I want to thank our moderators tonight and thank millions of Kenyans who are viewing and listening to this live debate. Leadership is about ability. It's about passion. It's about vision. It's about love for the people you want to work for. It's about trust. It's about creating hopes for many who are in hopeless situations. We need deliberate change. We need to break from the past so that we can have a new Kenya that propels itself to a better future. All I seek tonight to those who are watching and listening is to work for them. I offer the best choice for the presidency. I thank you. God bless Kenya. God bless us. Thank you. Thank you. Uhuru Kenyatta. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. I think it's been an engaging evening. I want to conclude by saying that um, Kenya is a country with great potential. Kenya is a country that is just about ready to take off. 
what Kenya needs is to change and to break away from the past. For far too long, politicians have engaged themselves with bickering as to who holds what position, as opposed to really dealing with the issues that affect the common man. What I promise and give my commitment to Kenyans is that I will lead a government, together with my colleagues in Jubilee, that will be a listening government that seeks to transform this nation, that seeks to unleash the potential that we have, especially amongst our youth, and one that will not focus itself on blaming individuals for this or that, but rather be driven by action and true solutions that will bring positive change to the people of Kenya. I Thank ask you. you and ask the people of Kenya, vote for me, vote for our Jubilee Coalition, Thank you. and let us together transform this nation. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Kiyapi. Kenyans are an example of what is possible in this country. A hearts boy who had no chance of going to school, but I went at the age of 11, and today I'm asking you to be your president. I would like to give this promise to every child in all our 47 counties. I bring into leadership new freshness. I'm new in politics, but I've been 20 years in public service. All I want to do is to serve you. And if you give me a chance, I will give my best so that every Kenyan can live in dignity, in a secure country, and we can be united. That's my promise to you if you make me the next president of the republic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will conclude it uh, philosophically. Each one of us, whether they are aspiring presidential candidates or any Kenyan or any human being, there is a unique character trait that God has placed in each one of us. There's something unique in Paul Mwite that is not in, in us. There's something unique in Raila, Prime Minister Raila Odinga. There's something unique that is in Martha Karua. There's something unique in all of us. The best thing is we appreciate. We don't dwell on the weaknesses each one of us has. There's a philosopher who was asked, why are you in good terms with the elderly and the youngsters? He said, when I look at the youngsters, I just tell myself, they came before this world and they contributed to the development of humanity. And uh, I like the positive aspect of it. And he was asked about the youngsters. He says, I came before them and I've done a lot of corruption before them. So they are safe. So we, we need to look and appreciate. Kenya is, is known historically to frustrate its potentials. We need to change from that, appreciate one another, come together Thank you. and uh, pray. I agree with the in Indian monk who Thank put it in the newspaper Your time that is up. one million Five Kenyans seconds. should write to God for the best decision. I'm not asking you to vote for me, vote for the best, according to Thank Yajim. you. Thank you so much. And I think what we do all agree on is this is a great nation, is that indeed Kenya is poised for incredible growth, that we have a youth bulge that could be such an amazing resource if they had the opportunity. And what we do want to do is thank you all for your participation tonight in allowing the country now to take a look at you as candidates and perhaps make their decision. Asante Nisana. Indeed, we thank you very much, and uh, we set out for two to do two hours, but we've done three and a half hours. We thank the candidates for being part of a very, very beautiful evening, and so do we thank the audience mm -hmm. for our wonderful time here. Thank they you. deserve a warm round of applause. We welcome. We welcome the candidates' uh, supporters to go up and congratulate them and their Kenyans. You have had it at last, a live debate between the men and the women who want to be your president. Tonight you've heard their positions on governance, security, education and health as well. Do not miss the second round of the debate when the candidates take to the podium once more in two weeks' time, precisely the 25th of February. Joe Agee of KTN and Udwa Kamimo of Citizen TV will moderate the second debate. And from me, Lina Skaikai of NTV and Julia Gishuru of Citizen, it's been a great pleasure and honor 
being with you tonight. It certainly has. And on behalf of the chairman of the Presidential Debates Committee, Washira Waruru, and all the teams from the various Kenyan media houses who have joined hands to produce this debate, I'd like to thank the candidates once again who participated in the debate, the viewers, everybody in here today as well, the listeners around the country and all over the world as well for making this debate a reality. And as I hand over now to Studio B, where an eminent panel of analysts is breaking things down for you tonight, Let's remember, all of us, to put Kenya first and to maintain our national mantra of peace, love and unity throughout the elections. God bless you and God bless Kenya. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.